This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Governor's Baker, Baker March 12th order suspending certain positions of the open meeting law allows us to hold this virtual town meeting. I will call upon each counselor by name. At that time, you will unmute their mic and say present. And please make sure you then mute it again so that we don't get the feedback I'm getting right now. So when you're not speaking, remain on mute. Um, this is how we will conduct the council conference throughout the agenda. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the meeting to order at 6.32. There is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Serge or Athena know. To make a comment, you are to ask a question, use the raise your hand function. And um, if diff technical difficulties arise as a result of utilizing remote participation, I will decide how to address the situation. Discussion may be suspended while we address technical issues and the minutes will note if a disconnect occurs. Athena and Serge will be monitoring counselors' connections and if necessary, we will pause the meeting until we can get everybody to reconnect. So with that, I'm going to call the roll. Shalini Balmilne. Present. Alyssa Brewer. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Marcy DeMont. Present. Lynn Griesmer present. Uh, Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Dorothy Pam. Present. Evan Ross. Present. George Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Present. Steve Schreiber. Present. Andy Steinberg. Present. Sarah Schwartz. Present. Great. Thank you. Um, we are just going to have a brief screen showing the upcoming meetings of the council. And let me state that in addition to that, in the packet tonight are the um, Board of Health order regarding masks in the downtown area and a map that shows what the perimeters are of that area. Uh, please make sure you look that over because the enforcement of that starts this evening. Uh, parking enforcement also resumes today. So with that, we're going to move on to the hearings. And um, we have two hearings that are joint petitions of um, Verizon and Eversource. The first one is about the Eversource request to install two jointly owned poles on Belchertown Road. Uh, Mass General Law Chapter 166, Section 22 requires the council hold a public hearing on the petition of any utility provider to construct or locate poles, conduits, or underground wires for the transmission of electricity. This hearing is based on the May 12th, 2020 petition of Eversource to install two jointly owned poles on Belchertown Road. The first is to be set at 9-7M on your map placed in line with, with an approximately 128 feet southeasterly of existing pole 970. The pole center line is approximately 27 feet from the road center line. The second is the 9.71 M to be placed in line with an approximately 100 feet southeasterly of existing 971. The pole center line is approximately 33 feet from Belchertown Road center line, 67 feet from Harkness Road center line, and approximately 23 feet to the left of the fire hydrant. This plan is shown on your screen and is page four of the document. As required by statute written notice of the time and place of the hearing was mailed on July 27, 2020 to all owners and real estate abutting the proposed poll locations. The Department of Public Works has recommended um, approval of this petition and reminds the petitioner that a street opening permit must be obtained prior to commencing work. With that, I'm officially opening the hearing. Um, 
questions need to get to my participants. And uh, first of all, uh, Carla Tresino Laramie, would you have any additional comments you would like to make about the petition? No, that it's straightforward. Okay. With that, are there any questions from the council? Okay, I see none. Uh, are there questions from the public? I think Kathy wanted to ask a question. Oh, I see it now, Kathy. Sorry. Go ahead, Kathy. I was having a hard time getting the raise my hand button, so I just raised my hand. Um, my only question is, since I can't see how wide the road is, I heard the setback from the center line. My question was, um, I, I don't think there are sidewalks currently along that part of the road. If there would ever be sidewalks, are these poles further, farther enough away, far enough away that they wouldn't um, require me get in the way of a sidewalk. So it's, I understood it's, you said 30 feet, you know, it's a far from the middle line, but I don't know what the um, side of the road is like and how deep that goes. So that's the question. Carla, is that either a question you want to take on or shall we ask um, uh, Guilford Mooring, who's with us tonight? Go ahead, Carla. Well, Guilford could probably help on that, but there are two existing poles there already. So if at any time a sidewalk is proposed, then we would have to just move the poles. So instead of moving two poles, we would have to move four poles at that point. But um, Gil, but that is, there's a lot of room between the side of the road and um, the, the properties. I don't know if anybody's ever been by there. It's kind of weird. But um, yeah, um, the DPW can probably answer that better than I can. But we will always move poles if we need to in the future. Bert, is there any additional response to that? Just, it is, it's a very wide layout in that area and it's flat. So if we actually had to add sidewalks or a multi-use path, there's plenty of room to do it in that area. Okay. That is a great question. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Kathy. Andy Steinberg. Yes. I just wanted to uh, um, say for thank my fellow counselors uh, a little bit from my select board experience. Uh, we had had some problems uh, with uh, trees um, and the fact that there were uh, objections made after poll hearings about shade trees uh, that were affected by the um, construction of the poles. And as a result, we as a select board had developed the practice of asking that the tree warden uh, be asked in advance of poll hearings whether there was any trees that were of concern um, to him. And um, I had uh, made a request that Mr. Snow be um, asked that question regarding both hearings. And uh, I understand uh, from the town manager that uh, the tree warden has indicated that there's not a problem. Are there any other counselor questions at this time? Okay, then I do see that we have one attendee question. It is related to this hearing on the polls. John Bonifaz. Okay. Uh, the, they put their hand down. The person has put their hand down. Are there any people from the public who would like to ask a question? Are there any people from the public who would like to speak in favor? Are there any people from the public who would like to speak in opposition? Are there any other questions from the council? Uh, hold on. I want to go back. Is Solda Ortego Bustamante, is this in relationship to this particular hearing? This is in relation to the consolidation of the polling station? No, uh, this, okay. is, this is around poles to be built by the Eversource on Route 9. I apologize, my connection had dropped out. I will withdraw and wait. We understand, thank you. Uh, Pat DeAngelis, do you have a question? Uh, yes, um, and I don't know whether um, 
this can be answered or not. I noticed in the application for these polls that it said there would be, this was not in preparation for 5G technology. And since I have resident concerns about that technology, I'm wondering if Verizon or Eversource are planning anything around bringing 5G to Amherst. Yes, uh, Guilford, please respond. So for this speci these specific ones, there's no 5G in the, air in the area. There's already, I think, a 5G site further down towards Gatehouse Road, if I remember correctly. Um, but there is no overall plan that we've seen for 5G from Verizon at this time, and we're not really sure we will see one. Thank you, Gilbert. Go for it. Are there any other questions from the council? Okay, then seeing none, I'm going to declare that this public hearing is closed. We will later in the agenda be voting uh, and an opportunity on this petition. For that, we're going to move on to the other petition again from um, Eversource, and it's on Blue Hills Road and Orchard Street. And Carla, did we determine that you're going to be speaking to that as well? What um, Michael just texted me while we were you were discussing this, and he thinks it's if it's a state job, the state may be petitioning for that poll. Okay, the papers that we have received mm -hmm. are petition, in fact, from EverSource. Okay, and it is oh. to, uh, install two jointly owned polls. The first to be set at number 13 IS on the map, uh, 1S, to be placed directly across from 13 uh, slash 1 on Blue Hills Road and will support the reverse corner for the moving poles on the main road due to the Mass DOT road project. And the second is number 99E2 to be placed approximately six feet from the fire hydrant on Orchard Street. This poll is needed due to Mass DOT's road project as well, and will support a single phase side tap that feeds Orchard Street. Also, both poles will have down guys and anchors. So it is a petition from Eversource. Yes. Oh. Okay, okay. Um, what I'm gonna do is I just see the project number on here. I'm just gonna text that to uh, Mike Rosenberg and see what he wants to do. Um, does anybody have any questions about it? Uh, it's like I said, it's not my project, but if it's just, um, I'll proceed with that. Okay. Okay. Sure. So, um, with that, um, counselors, do you have questions? Mandy Jo Haneke. Mandy Jo, you have I'm your. Working on it. Hmm. You seem to be having trouble unmuting, Mandy Jo. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we can hear you. Nope, now we can't. Come on. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. I don't you know are. whether it's a slow mouse response or not. So I, I guess I didn't quite understand the petition for the Blue Hills Road one that's going in the corner. Um, it seems like it's going across from current polls now. So does that mean that is, is this a permanent one or is this really just for the during the construction? Um, because things are moving during the construction and you need to keep the wires there or if it's permanent, are the wires going to be crossing the roads multiple times extra than they are now? I guess I'm, I'm looking for a little more explanation as to the purpose of this one and why it's across from where all the current poles are. No, uh, Guilford. Yeah, so this one is a new crossing. They had to adjust, when they adjusted the poles, they needed to move the feed up the street a little bit. And so they did put a, a new pole, they're asking to put a new pole across the street. This is a permanent pole and it will provide power down Blue Hills. It's just how they relocated the poles on North uh, Northampton Road is why they have to do this. Do you have a further question, Mandy Joe? Yeah. I, I guess my question is, do, do we like having that many additional crossings or is, is, is this the only place that pole can go or could it go to limit the number of crossings of streets? No, the pole needs to go where it is to try to keep the, the 
the Eversource, and I hope the Eversource person corrects me if I'm wrong, but Eversource likes to have, you know, you have to have your forces equal on your poles and to keep the forces equal, if they kept the connection where it was, they would actually need a couple more poles, just as guide poles and anchoring poles. So this, by doing this, it reduces the number of poles and guy wires you have to have along the line. Okay, thank you. Are there additional questions from the council? Okay, now we're going to move to questions from the public. And again, this is only in regard to the siting of these uh, polls for Eversource. Uh, there'll be other public comment at other times. Are there any questions from the public? Any public who would like to speak in favor? Any public who would like to speak in opposition? And then I'm back to the council. Are there any further questions from the council? Seeing none, then I'm go also going to close this public hearing. And again, later in the agenda, we will vote on these. Okay. We are now going to move to general public comments. So could you please take this down, Serge? Thank you. Let me just state later in the evening, uh, we are going to add two additional public comment opportunities. One is regarding the whole issue of the movement or the proposed movement of the polling places to consolidate them at the high school. And the second is around the issue of public safety following up on our vote with relationship to the uh, budget and the policing budget. Given that, are there any general public comments at this time? Okay, Carol Gray. Yes, hi, um, thank you for taking the comment. Uh, one question I have is what time will the public comment be on the uh, limitation, the proposal to limit the number of polling spots? And my second comment is that I would urge you to have public comment for the public at the start of every meeting. Pre-town council, that was always the procedure for every town committee or board that I was a member of. And I noticed that the, propo the um, proposal for a business was prioritized, but I think that the comments of the public should be the top priority, should even take precedence over business proposals. And um, it makes it more likely that the public will not participate if they have to be listening to a meeting for three hours. So I would urge you for future meetings to put public comment right at the beginning where it was pre-town council because we serve the public, we, you know, and, and we want to make it as easy as possible for the public to participate. And that was always the procedure previously. So I, I hope that you will uh, revamp your agendas. And, and please tell me what time the public comment that I want to speak to about the polls will be. At, uh, that will be around eight o'clock. Okay. Uh, Isolda Ortego Bustamante. Hi, I have a question and a comment. Um, my comment regards the proposal to consolidate um, the voting uh, locations, the polls, and I couldn't help but um, reflect on uh, the passing of John Lewis, who said, my dear friends, your vote is precious, almost sacred. It is the most powerful nonviolent tool we have to create a more perfect union. Regardless of the um, intention around public health, um, I understand that the public health director did not participate in designing this plan. And the other options, such as mail-in voting and early voting, are important to promote. However, um, we are expecting uh, some issues with the mail and already sort of threats from the federal government regarding the mail. Um, regular election workers, um, may be unavailable um, to work this election. That is true, but at the same time, it may be easier to find election workers 
for smaller election sites than for one large site. Um, the issue of contact tracing was also brought up by the council around this decision. But the problem is that the um, numbers will make it harder to, uh, to, to trace. The numbers of people will be more congregated. Um, the concern about the PVTA bus stop, uh, the council cited in its document a quarter mile or half mile, but uh, that's a really a concern for people who may be disabled or have small children. And the issue also that I am um, really concerned about is the idea of making this uh, permanent. And um, while you, you can debate the ways to address this during COVID, making this permanent then takes us into November where disabled people, people with small children who are attempting to take the bus will be dealing with weather. So in general, it feels like a very rushed decision that uh, is really endangering the voting rights of people who may already be disenfranchised. If anything, um, we support, you know, the efforts that are being made should be redoubled to encourage all, all the access to voting in every language. In terms of the, the comment, excuse me, um, but I really want to point out that I've already stated that we're going to do public comment about this at eight o'clock. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, so is the question, is this the right time to ask about the $80,000 that you said you were setting aside around the racism issue then? Because I is, was confused about when you wanted the comments and when you wanted the question. Okay. We will probably get to that agenda item sometime around 9.30, I hate to say. This the one about the 80,000? Yes. Okay, thank you. And um, I, I guess this is definitely an example of what the previous person was saying. You know, when you work all day and have kids and you're trying to do dinner, it's, you wanna try to participate. It's very, it's challenging to figure out exactly sort of like what is the moment over Zoom, but I appreciate your patience, thank you. Uh, again, we're going to do public comment on the elections and polling sites at around 8 and at around 9.30 on the community safety discussion. John Bonifaz. Yes, I just have a question about the public comment period at 8 o'clock. Will you be devoting a certain period of time for that? How much time? Uh, given that it was stated in the agenda that there would be public comment until 7.30. I'm just trying to understand what kind of time you're allowing for public comment Thank on the locations. Um, hopefully no more than about a half an hour. And I also want to say that at some point during the meeting, the council will consider whether or not we're going to be meeting on that specific item again on uh, the 10th of August. Thank you. At which point we would do additional public comment. Uh, Thank you. Gabrielle. Davila. Hi, thank you for letting me speak. Uh, I'd just like to say that I agree that I think public comments about the issues of police funding and voting rights should be moved towards the start of the meeting. Um, you know, as, as important as the Eversource topic was, I think it's pretty clear um, from what just happened and what most people would have predicted that um, you would have gotten more public comments on the other two items, and you, you know, really could consider moving those types of public comment hearings towards the start of the meetings, so that people don't go in the meeting and immediately see like a map of a proposed eversource plan, which is not necessarily inviting for them to engage with their local government. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Alyssa. Do you have a comment at this time? Uh I'm feeling super frustrated because I hear the frustration the public has, but we have a very different view of the purpose of public comment. And so it isn't simply one way. And so the idea that we have to let the public frame all of our issues and our decisions over the course of the night by speaking immediately first thing out of the box is in fact not what all committees were doing prior to when the town council came into play and so that isn't a fact that it changed with the town council it is one of the things the town council considered and you've been careful to show although it's really confusing i admit to say this is going to be public comment about this, this is general public comment, and this is other. And I think it's because there's just this fundamental disconnect between the fact that we just listen 
during public comment that it's not a discussion in any way, anything close to a public hearing that feels more like a discussion, but also isn't a discussion. And so I don't know what you do once people have already not followed the directions. I almost feel like we have to now open it up to people. So I, I share everyone's frustration that we wish this was simpler, but I don't know how to make it simpler. And it isn't that we don't wanna hear from the public, it's that there are things we have to do and hearing from the public is something we have to do, but we hear it from phone calls, emails, and all kinds of places in addition to public comment. So I don't know if we can come up with set times that will help people or what, but I don't know what to do if we're going to, if people are going to keep talking about the things that we're telling other people they can't talk about. I'd like to move on with the agenda, but Darcy, you have your hand up. I just wanted to say that if we aren't responding to public comment, I don't know why we just took that comment from one of the counselors. Um, Thank you. So I'd like to move on to the resolutions and proclamations. We have one for the Holyoke Soldiers Home and we need to show it on the screen. And with us tonight is Steve Connor, who is the veteran representative for the town of Amherst and I believe 15 or 16 other towns. And Steve, would you like to briefly speak to this resolution? Hi, yes, I would. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm gonna try this. This might be better, okay. I am uh, looking for the town of Amherst as well as the other towns within our district to support this resolution. The um, resolution is um, been written uh, by the committee to um, support the Hoyoke Soldiers Home, the coalition, I'm sorry, to support the Hoyoke Soldiers Home. And essentially, um, as people can see it, we are going through the history of the last pretty much 10 years of frustration about the Hoyoke Soldiers Home and the needs that have been there. Uh, one of the things that's not in the resolution was in 2017, as a member of the Western Mass Veteran Service Officers Association, I was asked to um, do an investigation and get a report to uh, the state rep from our area to address the inequities between the two soldiers' homes, the one in Chelsea and the one in Hoyoke, when there was so much study and so much planning done about the one in Hoyoke and the needs that were not being met. And we really feel like the not having those needs addressed for so many years is one of the greatest conditions that allowed that virus to spread so rapidly throughout the Hoyoke Soldiers Home in the end of March and into April, where 76 people who were tested positive for it had passed away. Um, two of them were Amherst residents. And it's very hard for me as the veteran service officer to have had to deal with that because I was the one who helped them get in there. Um, that's part of my job is to assist them in all aspects of veteran life and end of life. Uh, we did a disservice to these veterans. They should have gotten better care. This resolution is, if the town of Amherst is willing to sign it, we are going to be taking resolutions from everybody that we can get them from, provided to the to the governor and to the state legislature to make sure that our coalition has a voice at the table in the redesign and about the funding of the new soldiers home. We are, we are very happy that the state and the governor has come out and said that he is going to provide the funding, but he needs to do it by April 15th. And we want to have a voice in that the coalition is made up of other veteran service officers like myself, the former superintendent and deputy superintendent, 
members of family members of veterans who passed. And we have family members who still have loved ones in the soldier's home. And this is an opportunity to make sure our voices are heard. We know what goes on there better than people on the other side of the state. And we just feel like it's really important that towns support us in our efforts to make sure that when we do this, it's done right. It's done to address the needs throughout Massachusetts. Veterans come from all over the state to go to that soldier's home, but we have to do better. And I mean a whole lot better. So that's, that's why we're asking the city to, uh, the town to um, sign this resolution. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Thanks for your work. Oh. Uh, we uh, this uh, we did take the resolution as it was provided to us, and then put it into the format that uh, we do for our council. So, George uh, Ryan, please discuss GOL's. So, uh, Lynn, we met uh, at our last meeting on July 29th, and uh, we reviewed this, and the committee voted unanimously to declare it clear consistent and actionable. Okay. Is there any council discussion at this time? Yes, Dorothy Pam. I just want to second this resolution. Um, having taught, ha having looked at the soldiers home on the hill every time I drove to HCC, uh, knowing students who have worked there, um, and heard, having heard so many people speak of pride of that home, it was a matter of great shock to find out that the state had let it down and to create this, the, um, the chaos that resulted. So whatever can be done to restore it, to make it a safe place for everybody, a place where people wanted to go. It wasn't a place where people were put, but people wanted to go there because it was a great and pleasant place. So I really support this resolution. Are there any other comments from the town council at this time? Steve Connor, you have another comment? Yes, thank you. I, I just wanted to follow up on that statement because what I find uh, quite amazing in my work is that I'm now getting calls. Now that it's gotten stabilized there, I'm now getting calls from families whose fathers and mothers, uh, but the three calls I've gotten are fathers, who want to go into the soldier's home now, now that the thing is over. They still want to go there. There is a very unique thing about uh, veterans at end of life, and they want to be with their comrades. They want to be with the per people they served with. And so uh, we just want to give them what they deserve, which is a proper home to have end of life and with a, with a bathroom and a shower in their own room. Uh, I really don't think that's much to ask. Uh, you think of many facilities that already exist for many and, and we had people four in a room. Uh, my son is a nursing student at Hoyo Community College and he worked there during the fall semester. So he and I were not surprised at how bad this got once it was first identified. We can do a whole lot better. Thank you. Are there any other counselor comments at this time? We will be taking this up as part of the consent agenda, uh, which is where we're going to move to right now. The consent agenda, hold on one second, please. The following items were selected because they were considered to be routine, it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. To remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion later in the meeting, ask that it be removed when, the, when I list the consent agenda items. The request to remove an item from the consent agenda does not require a second. The motion reads as follows, to move the following items and the printed motions thereunder and approve these items as a single unit. The first one is adoption of the resolution regarding the Holyoke Soldiers Home. The second, with regard to the suspension of the Town Council Rules of Procedure 
for the following agenda items. Eversource request to install two jointly owned poles on Belchertown Road. Eversource request to install two jointly owned poles on Blue Hills Road and Orchard Street. And the master plan update request. When we use 8.4, that allows us to act without having to bring it back to a second meeting. This does not approve those items. And the final is approval of various minutes, those of July 2nd, 2020, the Joint Town Council Finance Committee minutes, those of July 7th, 2020, Joint Town Council Finance Committee meetings, the, the minutes from July 20th, 2020, Town Council uh, me meeting minutes, and July 28th, 2020, Joint Town Council and School Committee meeting Crocker Farm expansion presentation minutes. Kathy Shane, you have your hand up. Yes, I, I have a comment that is just a correction on the minutes for the Crocker Farm that were sent in to me of just the numbers aren't quite right. So I, I consider it just a minor edit and I could send that to Athena later. Um, it's a correction that was sent uh, that corrects um, uh, one set of, I can read it to you, or you can just assume it is, it's a uh, Maria Capexi statement, but it was, there was just a missing couple words. I, I think we then need to pull that off of this agenda. And so we will, and we'll approve it later in the meeting. Okay. okay. Uh, Darcy, you have your hand up. Yeah, I would like to remove, um, the suspension of town council rules of procedure 8.4 for 8G. Master plan update request? Yes. Okay, thank you. So this is the motion as it now reads, and then I need a second to move the following items and the printed motion there under and approve those items as a single unit. 6A, adoption of resolution regarding the soldier, Holyoke Soldiers Home. Suspension of town council rules of procedure 8.4 for the following agenda items. Eversource request to install two jointly owned poles on Town Road. Eversource request to install two jointly owned poles on Blue Hills Road and Orchard Street. Approval of minutes, July 2nd, Joint Town Council Finance Committee minutes, July 7th, 2020, Joint Town Council Finance Committee meetings minutes, July 20th, 2020, Town Council minutes. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. Thank you, Pat. That was very, a very terrific way to do a second by saying your name. Um, can we, we are going to, any further comments? We're going to move to a roll call vote. Okay. And in this case, I'm going to start with um, hold on. I'm going to start with Alyssa Brewer. Aye. DeAngelis. Aye. Dumont. Hi. Greasmers, yes. Haneke. Yes. Pam. Yes. Ross. Yes. Ryan. Yes. Shane. Yes. Schreiber. Yes. Steinberg. Yes. Schwartz. Yes. Balmel. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We can take that item down. We're then going to move to the approval of the Belchertown Road uh, Eversource petition, and then we'll do a separate vote for the Blue Hill Road and Orchard Street. So the motion for the first is as follows. Uh, to approve the order for pole location on Belchertown Road titled Order for Joint or Identical Pole Locations dated May 12th, 2020. Is there? Second, Mandy. Thank you, Mandy. Any further discussion? Then we'll move to a roll call vote on this. DeAngelis? Yes. Dumont? Yes. Reesmer? Yes. Anarchy? Yes. Pam? Yes. Ross? Yes. 
Ryan. Yes. Shane. Yes. Schreiber. Yes. Steinberg. Yes. Schwartz. Yes. Balmilm. Yes. And Brewer. Yes. Okay, the vote's 13 0, 0 nobody absent. We're moving to the next one, which is the Blue Hill Rose Road and Orchard Street. It's to approve the order for poll locations on Blue Hills Road and Orchard Street titled Order for Joint or Identical Poll Locations dated May 27th, 2020. Is there a second? Second, Haneke. Thank you. Is there a any further discussion? Okay, then in this case, we begin with Darcy Dumont. Yes. Reesmer, yes. Haneke. Yes. Pam. Yes. Ross. Yes. Ryan. Yes. Shane. Yes. Schreiber. Yes. Steinberg. Yes. Schwartz. Yes. Bell Milne. Yes. Brewer. Yes. And DeAngelis. Yes. Okay, that passes tw uh, 13 0, 0 nobody absent. We're going to move immediately to the Leverett extension of water line. And before we put the thing up, Serge, let me just make sure that we know who is in the room from Leverett. I'm here, Peter DeRico. Hi, Peter. How are you doing, Lynn? Just fine. Who else do we have from Leverett? I saw Julie earlier. You need to unmute. And Tom, Tom Hankinson. Oh, good. I didn't see Tom. Tom. Hi, Tom. Hi, how are you? Julie, can you unmute? How's that? Good. 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 Okay. okay. All right, thank you. So um, this is a extension. Uh, this is a request on the behalf of Leverett to extend our water line in from Amherst into Leverett. We do not need to approve this tonight, but it has been hanging out there as a question. And so I'm going to go ahead and call first of all on um, Paul, De Paul Bockelman, who I think then will be calling on Guilford Mooring and Peter DeRico. Paul? Yes, thank you, Lynn. So there's a long history to this that I think Lever can go into if the council would like, but um, the consideration by the town council is really about the impact on our water um, system and the impact that of extending the water line up East Leverett Road. So I will again quickly turn it over to Guilford who can sort of walk you through uh, what the considerations are for the town council as you consider this matter. Guilford. So yes, this, this started probably about at least 15 years ago. Um, the town of Leverett is having some issues with some private wells because of their old landfill and they can tell you more about that. Um, we've been, one of the concepts has always been that the easiest way and the the simplest way to solve the problem would be to connect them to our water system. Um, it does uh, require extending the water line. It's a little over a mile to uh, extend the water line all the way to the end. Um, you have a drawing, I believe, in your, your packet that shows the, where we're going with the water line. We're going down East Leverett Road, and then we take a left onto T Waddle. So, yep, so we start at East Leverett Road and we go down to into Leverett and take a uh, left on T-Bottle. Um, originally, it was going to be a um, eight inch water line, but then uh, we want, wanted to provide fire protection to the Amherst residents who are at the end of the line. There's three houses in the, in the top right corner of the drawing that are actually in Amherst. Um, we wanted to make sure we had fire protection there and Leverett wanted to make sure they had a connection for their fire um, apparatus as well. So it's now gonna be a 12 inch line. Um, we're proposing doing this together. The town of Leverett has designed it. The town of Amherst will bid it and oversee the construction. And we'll also merge in our um, repaving work that we were planning to do on East Leverett Road with this project. The repaving work, if this goes as scheduled, will probably be about a year earlier than what we thought it would be, but to do it all at one time will, would be the best for the whole project. And that's basically the project. Okay. Um, are there questions from the council 
at this time? Yes, Kathy. Yeah, um, I scanned the memo, and Guilford, you just said that Leverett would be paying for the construction cost. What is the estimate of the draw on water um, each year? So how much um, we're about to expand our ability to have water at cost. Um, so how much, how much consumption is on not just the putting in the pipes? Or there's the existing houses, if all the existing houses in Amherst and Leverett connect to this water line, you're adding 12 users, 12 families to the water system. That's it. And so by you saying it's 12, you're saying it's a small set of users? And yes, is that it's very, a small volume of <laughs> Yes, it's a very small volume of water. And then Lever, as they're getting it, would be paying the same water rates that we do in the town of Amherst? Yes, um, we serve some people in Belchertown and Pelham as, uh, now. And what we do for anybody who's in it, on the water system outside of town as we charge them the same rate. They're just part of our water system. They get charged the same connection fees, uh, same water rates, and if they have backflow devices, they are in our backflow program and all the whole nine yards, they become part of our system. Okay. Thank you. Um, I wondered if either Peter DeRico or Tom Hankinson or Julie Shively would like to make any comments at this time. Um, I'll do that, Lynn. Uh, and both okay. Julie and Tom can certainly pitch in. As uh, Guilford and Paul both said, this has been going on for quite a while, and I want to thank both of them for uh, a lot of conversation, a lot of hard work uh, uh, connecting us to Tate and Howard, who's a longtime contractor with Amherst for this type of project, uh, to get this thing worked out, uh, to also to bring it to the point at which the town of Leverett can afford to pay for it, even though it's going to also benefit people in Amherst. Um, that's a, a kind of a joint community effort to solve problems uh, in Leverett, but would also benefit residents in Amherst. And as Gilford said, also uh, add fire protection in that whole uh, area. Uh, I can speak to any questions that people might have them, but I think that the outline of the plan has been so thoroughly uh, worked over by uh, Guilford's office uh, that it's probably not really anything left open to uh, uh, to question about why this line or why the size, size of the pipe or any of that sort of stuff. Okay. Uh, Tom or Julie, anything else you'd like to add at this time? No, I would just like to thank um, again Paul and, and Guilford for their work on this. Okay. No, I'll echo that as well. Thank you. We're glad to have you here. Mandy Jo, you have a question. Yes. Um, it's a long line. A mile extension of a line is, is much longer than I was thinking until I looked at the maps. And um, 12 houses or so, as you said, would potentially be able to connect. So I'm curious what the maintenance on that portion of a line would be over, you know, 30 years, 20 years, um, in terms of um, you know how much that might cost what we could expect for that because you know we might only get three users quote paying for that and i know we don't always expect one potential portion of a line to generate enough revenues to maintain that portion of a line i'm just curious how out of sync that might be if at all well it is it is going to be a new line um so our maintenance is much less than it would be for the older lines uh, we have older lines that are over 100 years old, which actually have a lot more maintenance cost to us. From the age factor, it'll be an easy to maintain line. We do have routine maintenance we have to do. We would have to flush hydrants for water quality. We do have to do some sampling. Um, we would actually have to move two of our sampling points um, out towards this area so that we have a representative sample, sampling that we do every, every week. We do sampling for water quality. Um, it's not additional sampling, it just means we have to move our sampling sites farther away so we get a better picture. Um, so overall, it's not that much of an additional cost in the next 30 years. When you get to around 30, 40 years, then you might start finding that we need to do some pipe replacements and doing some repairs um, just 
just from normal wear and tear and failures in certain sections of pipe, which happens in our system now. So for the next 30 to 40 years, it's a pretty good deal and low maintenance. Thank you. Are there other questions from the council? I do have a question and that is, you've mentioned the benefit to additional people who live in here for water protection, but does it also open up additional development? The, the additional development is, is actually limited. Many of the spaces or many of the parcels along this road have actually either been put into um, conservation or they have some type of restriction on them that so they cannot be developed. So we're not looking, if, if we have 12 lots that we can serve that are already developed, there's probably no more than 12 lots, new lots that can be served out there. If you look at the drawing in the bottom left corner, you see a little cross hatch section. That section is actually too high an elevation for us to serve without them putting in some of their own infrastructure, which we don't normally do. So as you start looking towards the, the left side or the west side of East Leverett Road, the elevations in that area prevent you from developing on some of that property as well. So between elevation elevations and the river on the left, on the right, um, you really have some restrictions on what you can develop in that area. It won't be, it won't blow up into a large subdivision. Are there other questions from the council? Okay, so we already voted 8.4, which allows us to act tonight. Um, if we want to, at this point, we would vote to basically authorize the town manager to proceed with an interim municipal agreement with based on Mass General Law 40. So the motion reads as follows, and I'm making a motion to authorize the town manager to enter into an intermunicipal agreement with under Mass General Law Chapter 40, Section 4A, for the purpose of extending the Town of Amherst public water supply into Leverett 9100 LF to serve certain houses that are downgraded gradient of the closed and capped Leverett landfill. Is there a second? This is Andy, I second. Andy Steinberg has second. And is there any further discussion? Okay, then we're going to take a vote and we'll start with... Um, Lynn, Lynn, I just have a quick question. I'm seeing we, we have a draft of an intermunicipal um, agreement. So yes. motion, are we basically saying this is a, a good draft? I mean, it's got still a, a they talked about us as having select, uh, select boards, so the motion says, Paul, we had, and we're seeing the draft. Is that correct? Uh, the motion, the draft you're seeing is um, the draft, um, and it can still be edited. Obviously, that would be one of the ways it would be edited. Um, okay. So, we're, and we're I, yes, we're approving him entering this. We're not necessarily word in this draft. It's final, correct? Right. That's correct. Okay. Any other questions? We do need to vote to suspend Rule 8.4. So the first vote is to spend, suspend Town Council Rules of Procedure 8.4 for the consent agenda item. Is there a second? Haneke seconds. Thank you. We start with this one and Griesmer is yes. Haneke? Yes. Pam? Yes. Ross? Yes. Brian? Yes. Sean? Shane? Yes. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm always after Ryan. <laughs> Schreiber? I'm a yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Steinberg? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Sarah? I'm oh, sorry. Yes. Thank you. Shalini? Yes. Alyssa Brewer? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Yes. And Darcy DeMott? Yes. All right, given that with, with, is a 13 0, 0 nobody absent. We're moving on to the general, the overall motion, and that is to authorize the town manager to enter into an intermunicipal agreement 
under Mass General Law Section 40, Chapter 40, Section 4A, for the purpose of extending the Town of Amherst public water supply into Levert 9100 LF to serve certain houses that are down gradient of the closed and capped Levert landfill. Now, is there a second? Second, Steinberg. Okay. Alyssa, you have your hand up. Just in terms of discussion. Okay, Steinberg, it was the second uh, council discussion at this time. Alyssa? Just for fear that anyone would think I was being inconsistent when it came to intermunicipal agreements, I do normally prefer that we see the actual agreement that he's going to see, but I believe that this draft is adequate and that is why I'm willing to move forward. Okay, any other comment at this time? Okay, then we will start with Haneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Uh, Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Yes. Shalini Balmilm. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Darcy DeMont. Yes. And Greasemers, yes. The vote's 13 0, 0 with no absences. Thank you. And we look forward to um, having you join us in this intermunicipal agreement. Thank you very much. I Thank you very all much. Thank you. All the council, and again to Guilford for stellar help and Paul for shepherding it uh, along. Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank you. The next two items on our agenda come in the form of updates. The first one is the North Amherst Library update. And Paul, I'm going to call on you and then Chris Farley from Kuhn Riddle. Uh, thank you, Lynn. So um, we had an anonymous donor move, step forward who's expressed interest in um, supporting an addition to the North Amherst Library um, as part of this uh, uh, funding we did a, we had some money from um, appropriate by town meeting that allowed us to move forward on preliminary designs which we have completed and we hired Coon Riddle to complete the design so where we are now is that we're prepared to move into the um, stage where we start to prepare drawings in advance of going out to um, bid for the actual construction of the addition it's a it's a significant significant addition to the library and I thought it was important for the council to review it to look at it just to make sure we're all on the same page as we as we start to move forward and um, and then and then as we move forward we'll engage the community in a larger discussion talk about what should be in it what shouldn't be in it but we have some preliminary um, images to share with you and to share with the public so that's what we'd like to do tonight and Chris from Coon Riddle is here um, and, and Guilford's been very involved with this as well um, so if I could turn it over to Chris uh, Lynn please so this is the site plan that oh, well. our folder if, there, if there's anything else please let us know Chris oh, okay um, uh, well, uh, good evening to uh, town council uh, president and council members. Uh, thanks very much for uh, inviting me to come to give you this update. Um, I, I will say that I'm, I'm calling in from my home in Ashfield and there's a bit of a delay. And so uh, if we have uh, any sort of dialogue and it sounds like I'm speaking over anyone, my apologies, it's just due to the delay. Um, so, so yeah, we have several images here. The first one is the site plan. Um, my understanding is uh, from uh, Mr. Bockelman that the, uh, the council has been briefed on the, a little bit of the background of the project. So I'm gonna focus on uh, design issues. Um, and so uh, starting with the site plan, um, what we've developed is a, an addition uh, to the library. It's a one-story addition. Uh, on this site plan, it is between the parking area and the existing library. Um, the, the new accessible entry will be from uh, the back of the building, the north side. Uh, the, 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 build, the, the library itself is quite a gem, an architectural gem, and we wanted to preserve the look and the feel of it as much as practical. So we have the addition and the new entry in back. 
uh, where we can preserve the, the front facade, the south facade of the building. Um, so the, the, uh, uh, what's, what's involved with the design is this one-story addition uh, and a connector between the, uh, the, the accessible entry, uh, bathrooms, and meeting room to the existing library. Uh, there'll be a, a, a little bit of a realignment of the parking um, and, and a formalization of the parking. We'll have a several uh, accessible parking spaces and then an accessible path from the parking up to the, the new entry in the rear uh, and then a, an accessible path up to the level of the library, which is about five feet above this new, the entrance in the new addition. Um, the, the work will include a certain amount of landscaping on the two sides and the rear of the building to help the new addition settle into the site. Um, we, we intentionally, uh, just as we left the front of the building unchanged uh, to preserve the integrity and the look of it, uh, we've also maintained all or, or proposing to maintain all the plantings in the front and on the side of the building so that it it really remains uh, really quite similar uh, to, to the way it is today. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. So uh, this is a floor plan. Uh, the, the rectangle toward the bottom of the screen is the existing library. Um, this is the same orientation as the site plan we just looked at. So the existing entry is at, uh, of the library is up the steps at the bottom of the, of the, of the sheet. The new entry is at the top of the sheet. Um, you, we, we're not looking at the parking, but the parking would be just off the top of the sheet. So the new entry comes in and is more or less uh, in line with the middle of the existing library. Um, when someone uh, comes in, there's a small lobby. Uh, lobby. Uh, to the left uh, are, will be two new uh, bathrooms, accessible bathrooms, a uh, new janitor closet, and a new small storage room. Uh, to the right would be a meeting room. Uh, and the intention is that the meeting room uh, could be for uh, library business, library functions, uh, could also be for community meetings or community functions. Um, the, the idea is that the, the meeting room and the bathrooms could remain open even when the library is closed. So there's a set of double doors uh, between the entry lobby and the stairs on this plan uh, that represents uh, uh, doors that could be locked to uh, close the library but uh, maintain the, the meeting room. Uh, open. And then in the middle of the plan, there's a, 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 a kind of a connector piece. We, we kept it as small as possible, and that has a, a new stair down into the basement, a new stair up to the library level. As I said, it's about five feet. And then between those two stairs, there's a, a wheelchair lift. And the wheelchair lift is what makes this uh, that makes the main floor of the library accessible. Someone can come in uh, from the parking on the north, come into the building, uh, get into the wheelchair lift if they're not able to negotiate stairs and get up to, uh, to the main library level where the, the librarian is and where the stacks are. Um, let's see here. Um, the other thing I'd like to talk about with this plan is improvements to the existing library. So um, this design uh, primarily focuses on uh, a fully accessible entry and the other, the other spaces that I just mentioned. But there are some improvements to the library building uh, which are necessary and, and um, uh, will, in, will improve the library. Uh, one is some structural improvements. Um, in the front of the library, in the basement, um, there's a, 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 a part of the foundation is being uh, pushed in uh, and that's causing some, some repercussions uh, throughout the structure. Uh, we intend to, uh, to have that fixed. Um, there will be new mechanical system, uh, heating uh, and cooling system installed, uh, new electrical uh, where it is possible and practical. Uh, uh, 
possibly new lighting, uh, energy efficient uh, lighting, uh, and a, an upgrade to the existing fire alarm system. Um, the intention is to preserve the existing building as much as possible and practical. And so uh, any of these uh, proposed improvements, we will try to preserve the look, the feel, the finishes, uh, et cetera, of the existing library. Uh, if you could go on to the next slide, please. So these are a couple of exterior elevations. Um, the, the one in the upper left is the, the new entry elevation uh, to the building. Uh, and the one in the lower right is the uh, west elevation. So the existing library is on the right with the shingle roof and the addition, which is the lower form, uh, is uh, on the left. So we've taken our cue for the, 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 the look, the feel, the massing of the, of the addition from the existing library. Uh, our feeling was that um, it was important to, uh, again, to maintain the, the, the integrity of the existing library. And our feeling was to, to take all of our architectural and design cues uh, from that building. So uh, we've, we've, we've uh, used the same steep roof pitches. Uh, we've used uh, a lot of the same materials, uh, shingle siding, painted wood trim. The proportion and sizing of the windows uh, are, are uh, taken directly from the existing building. Um, we have introduced a few new materials, um, but basically we uh, we really did try to have this addition uh, feel as though it belonged uh, stylistically with the existing building. It will obviously be a, a new addition and it will appear so, but stylistically and architecturally, it, will, it should fit in very, very nicely with the existing building. Um, if you look at the elevation in the upper left, the, the new entry, uh, there's a very steep gable uh, uh, roof over the main entry. And then a, a similar um, uh, gable to the right, which is uh, um, a bay into the new meeting room. And those roof forms are taken directly from the existing entry uh, to the library, which has a very steep roof. I think it's about uh, an 18, 12, uh, 18 and 12 roof pitch, uh, 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 unusually steep. And so we've, tr we've, we've replicated that trying to, again, to bring some of that that uh, feel and experience of going into the, the existing entry into this new accessible entry. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. So this is a, an eye level perspective of a, a preliminary rendering of what the addition would look like from the new parking lot. So from the north side, um, there are the two gables. Uh, as I said, the larger uh, gable that comes farther forward, that's the new entry. Uh, and again, the intention is to use some of the same detailing and, and proportions uh, as the existing building has, um, uh, but to update it a bit. Um, and uh, you can see there's a, uh, a new walkway uh, just to the south of the parking, a fully accessible walkway um, to, to go into the building. Um, one, one more uh, minor feature of, the, of, of this being proposed is a, um, a book drop uh, that people can use from the outside. Uh, I know that that was something particularly that the librarians uh, were interested in including here. So. We do have a, uh, a book drop that can be utilized even when the library and the edition is closed. Um, and if you could go to the next slide. So this, this is uh, just a, a a slightly different view of that new addition and the new entry. Um, you can just see the existing library kind of peeking out uh, on the left side behind this addition. Um, 
I will say that these renderings are, are really quite preliminary. Uh, obviously, there's no background. It looks like we're on a, a flat plane. Uh, what we've really focused on uh, in these preliminary images is just trying to represent uh, the massing, the form, the detailing, uh, some of the materials and potential colors uh, of, of what this addition uh, might look like. Um, from a, from a uh, color point of view, our intention is to pick colors that are compatible with the existing library, but to, but to use a slightly different palette so that it is clearly uh, not a period uh, building, but a new addition uh, that's, been, that's been proposed. Um, the, the, the plantings that are represented here are really uh, just used for the purposes of the rendering. Um, we haven't really taken the design far enough to know exactly what the plantings will be. Um, that's something, as Mr. Bockelman said, that we would be doing, um, uh, the architect would be doing in the next phase of work if this project does move forward. So, so that's, a, that's a, I hope, a fairly quick overview. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions or uh, give additional information if, if anybody would like that. Thank you. Uh, Dorothy, you have your hand up. Um, I just want to say it's, I, I love the design and I love the pitched roof, which reminds me of a former house. Uh, but that leads me to a question. The addition is one story, uh, but the roof is high and pitched. Will that mean it'll be a, uh, a high roof inside the meeting room? Um, and the other second question is about the handicapped accessible entrance. Um, I myself would not be coming in in a wheelchair, but I would, I would like to avoid the stairs. So can a person standing with or without a cane get on that wheelchair lift easily? Those are my two questions. Well, so uh, to answer the, the questions in order, uh, it does, the, the, the addition does have a steep uh, roof pitch. Um, we will have a uh, probably at least a 10 foot ceiling uh, in the in the addition, uh, but a large portion of the attic is intended to be used for uh, mechanical equipment and duct work uh, to heat and cool the, the, the new addition. So uh, it, the, the, the roof structure will not be exposed inside the meeting room or inside the addition. But our intention is that it will have a ceiling that's high enough uh, so that it feels really quite similar to the library, if not even a bit taller. And then um, to answer the second question, absolutely. And anyone who needs help uh, or, or cannot negotiate the stairs can use the wheelchair lift. Uh, it has a simple gate uh, that's easy to open. Uh, you would step onto the platform, push a button, much like an elevator. Uh, it's a, it would be a hydraulic wheelchair lift. Uh, and it would probably take uh, about 15 seconds maybe to go from the, uh, the new entry level up to the library level. And then there's another gate at the top to get out. So, so it's, it's very easy to use. Well, thank you very much. Andy Joe. You're welcome. Yeah, um, mine's not really as much of a question as a, you know, I saw that the addition of the book drop and, and I applaud that um, it made me wonder and, and, basically ask to ensure that that the librarians that that use you know that work in the library right now and our library director are consulted on other small things like that that would make their life easier and all of that and I just wanted I assume that's happening but I wanted to confirm that that would be the case going forward too um, absolutely um, we we've been working with library staff uh, from um, uh, early uh, 2018 uh, when we when our, our proposal was accepted for the study and uh, it's certainly my understanding that we will continue to work with uh, library staff uh, as well as community members uh, as the design moves forward. Okay. Kathy Shane. Uh, thank you. Uh, the design looks beautiful, um, I have to say. Um, I have some specifics, so I'll, I'll just rattle some of them off. How many people will the meeting room hold if, um, let's, let's assume someday we're out of the COVID world where we all have to be six feet apart. So 
uh, Sarah Schwartz, who's also um, a counselor. Up. We don't have a district space right now to meet in. So I'm just curious on how many people could comfortably sit in that room. Um, so I'll start with that. And then along with that same question is our library. That library has very restricted hours right now. So it, it's clear that from the entryway, we could get into the meeting room and or the bathrooms without going through the library. Will there be a way that someone in town hall can push a button and let us in? Will someone have to drive up there to let us in? So how would um, weekend access, after hours access work? So I'll, I'll stay just there. And then I'm gonna just say one more on the, the design of the um, new part. Um, there are two bathrooms that you're putting in, and I've asked this before, why two? And the answer is because you have to. <laughs> Somehow we, can, we just can't do unisex bathrooms, even though they exist everywhere. So I don't know whether it would be space or cost savings, but the way I see a lot of them done in Europe, a little less frequently here, is there's a water closet that has the toilet in it. And then the sink is outside the two toilet areas. And the advantage of that is if you just want a drink of water or you just want to wash your hands, you don't have to occupy a bathroom. So it's get, and then you can have either fewer sinks or one hot water line. So I don't know whether um, that saves or is that a simple. And then my last, the stairs downstairs off the new addition into the downstairs of the old library, there is a bathroom downstairs and it's restricted public access right now because the stairs going down are dangerous unless you're an, a very nimble person. Um, we used to use it all the time when my kids were little and then it's it's a pretty tricky staircase. So does that be a, is, could that be a bathroom um, that's down there, would that be mainly for staff use? So I'm just gonna leave it on um, I have a few others, but they're they're picky ones. So it's more about this new edition. Okay, well, thank you. Um, well, as far as the occupancy of the meeting room, uh, the current uh, calculation is between 40 and 45 people could occupy occupy that room if we had chairs that are that are uh, uh, you know stacked uh, uh, and and set in the usual uh, type of uh, 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 condition. Um, we intentionally are trying to keep the occupancy below 50, uh, simply because when you have an occupancy of 50, uh, you need a door, a second door that goes directly outside from the space. Um, and we're trying to keep things simple so we can just have that one door from the, uh, entry vestibule, uh, into the, into the meeting room. Um, uh, I'm going to skip to the to the bathroom uh, uh, question uh, we haven't we haven't looked at the idea of doing the European style bathrooms with the uh, sinks outside uh, but we could certainly we could certainly do that uh, that would be an easy thing to study and to talk with the library staff about um, so I'd be happy to to uh, you know as this project moves forward be happy to, to study that and, and do an alternate plan that would show that uh, and then the basement, um, the intention as part of this plan is that the bathroom in the basement, which is not accessible uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, that that bathroom will be removed. Um, as part of, the, part of this work, the bathroom will be um, uh, storage only. It will not be accessible to the public. So it's really only available to library staff uh, for library storage. Um, the, the, the fact that we're putting the two accessible bathrooms in really does make that existing bathroom obsolete. Uh, so the, 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 the town and uh, the library staff has instructed us to, to remove it in order to provide additional storage. And yeah. then in terms of hours, um, I, I'm sorry. Um, in terms of hours, I think, um, uh, Paul, I would ask you maybe to address that, uh, if you could. So the town is moving progressively over time to more uh, the key card access to space instead of physical keys. So this would be part of that, that process. And then that gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of remotely opening doors and, and monitoring who's, who's in and who's accessed them and things like that. 
Thank you. Sarah Schwartz, you have your hand up. So my questions are a little bit uh, uh, more cosmetic. Um, one of them has to do with, you had mentioned that you wanted to keep the colors on the edition um, compatible, but somewhat different than the front. Um, and I'm just thinking that the colors of the library are one of the things um, that I think is most attractive about the library. And I feel like because you did, and I'm not an architect, <laughs> but because you did such a good job sort of melding the two together, I think it would look nicer just to have the same colors throughout. It would look less like we just stuck an addition on the back, which is what we did. But um, if we're going for the same look, I would want to keep it, I think the paint colors should go with. Um, and then my second question was about the stacks and um, in the original part of the library and the window seat in the children's section. I'm just wondering if those things would remain the same. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I think I understand your first point about the colors. Um, I, I think we, in, in this rendering and in this particular preliminary design, we took a took the approach where we wanted it to be different but compatible. Uh, it would be quite easy to look at some alternative color schemes. We usually do that as a matter of course uh, when it comes to a project like this. So I think what I would say is that we would certainly, uh, we would look at having the colors be uh, more similar if, if not using the same colors as the existing library as one of the options. And then we could evaluate that with, uh, with the town and with uh, library staff um, and, and make a recommendation. Uh, so I think we, we could look at, certainly uh, could and will look at options. Um, and then, um, I'm sorry, I've already forgotten what the second question was. I was just wondering if My this- My apologies. That's okay, that there's a lot of questions coming at you. Um, I was just wondering if the stacks, the actual stacks in the main part of the library, and there's also the window seat in the children's section, I was just wondering if those were going to same or be redone. Okay, thank you. Um, so the short answer is yes. Uh, the intention is to keep uh, the stacks uh, and, and the, the circulation, again, the look and the feel, the existing finishes to keep them as is. Um, the uh, the stacks, uh, most of the stacks as they are now, do actually meet accessible uh, accessible guidelines. Uh, um, uh, the uh, Architectural Access Board uh, guidelines and requirements. They are tight, but as long as we have 36 inches between the stacks. Um, that uh, does meet the letter of, 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 the, of the regulations. And yes, the intention is to keep that window seat um, uh, as it is. In the interest of time, I'm gonna ask Paul if you could just quickly review for us what the next steps are and stressing the fact that there are going to be other opportunities for particularly members of the community that use this library to weigh in. So Paul. Sure, thank you. Um, so yeah, this is just to give you a, a snapshot to see if there's any sort of stop what you're doing kind of comments from the council. Uh, there's a very lengthy permitting process that has to come into play at Conservation Commission, the Planning Board or Zoning Board, the Design Review Board, they have to get a permit from the State Highway. Um, we want to do community uh, meetings uh, in the neighborhood to understand, you know, just to float this and see how people are responding to that. Um, the anonymous donor is anxious to keep moving forward on this, so we're anxious to accept the funds for this and move forward as well, because I think it's a, it's, it's a unique opportunity for the town. We don't get this kind of thing, this kind of philanthropic thing very often. So um, we want to be, we wanna be uh, courteous and accepting of it. Uh, because the anonymous donor also wants to work on the construction in terms of making a donation for the construction. So our, we went into this, we had the, uh, the appropriation from town meeting in 2017. We've used that to get to this point. The anonymous donor has, a, has said that they were interested in moving to the next phase, which is the design permitting stage till we get to construction documents. And then there's a stop point again, 
And then if we have the funds in hand to go to the actual construction, we will move forward. So we're doing this one step at a time with money in hand before we take the next step. So again, a really unique opportunity, a very treasured building. The library uh, trustees are very clear that they wanna keep this as a library uh, for the foreseeable future. This expands our uh, needed um, capacity for meeting space in, in North Amherst. And I mean, I think I think Kunrudel did a, just a gorgeous job um, with the design. It takes into account um, a lot of other things in terms of the layout. Guilford's been really pivotal in helping to frame how we should be looking at this. Um, and uh, Sharon Sherry has been involved as well from the beginning. So. Uh, unless there's anything negative from the council, we will, I will talk to the anonymous donor and if that happens, we will keep moving on this project. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Dorothy? Um, just a quick question. In discussions about the not quite ever built um, new intersection in North Amherst, which is right next to the library, I've seen some drawings or possibilities which had the road on one side closed. Um, I'm assuming that whatever those future plans might be have been considered by Kuhn Riddle in making this design so that it doesn't preclude any of the options? Yes, the, the, we're working really hard not to exclude options for either, either option for the library or for the roads. So we're working hard to keep them so they don't conflict. Um, thank you. Um, I really, again, would like to keep to as much of our schedule as we can. So thank you very much for joining us, Chris. Uh, and then in the case of the agenda. Thank we you. To, yes, we're going to move on to a quick update from the Energy and Climate Action Committee. They did place something in your packet very, very, very late in the afternoon. Uh, but is Laura Drucker with us and Stephanie Chigarello? Hi, this is Stephanie Chigrello, Sustainability Coordinator for the town. I don't believe Laura is on yet, but I can very quickly text her. Uh, but in the meantime, I can get started. Um, just bear with me one second. Okay, sorry, this virtual world. Um, so we just wanted to go over the, the timeline for the um, Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Action Grant that the town received, which was to create a climate action adaptation and resilience plan for the town. And through that process, we created a timeline. Originally, the grant, um, when we received the grant, was before COVID, and we had a much tighter timeline within our phase one. Because of COVID, we were able to actually transfer some of the tasks into a phase two into the next fiscal year. So that actually gave us a lot more breathing room to, uh, to work on this process. So right now, we've gotten through um, much of what's identified here as phase one where we've um, secured our consultant Linnaean Solutions Inc. from Cambridge. And we've worked with the team of Jim Newman, uh, Lauren De La Parra, who is actually a former UMass graduate student. And um, we are also working with our community member, um, Guzzi Kajanikowski, as, um, as a community engagement specialist. So for phase one, we looked at um, just basically identifying the team and identifying some of the tasks and prioritizing some of the um, projects by looking at things that were identified in the phase one um, process of the MVP planning, which was first the planning grant, which we received a year ago or so, and which we brought community get uh, community members together to talk about what are some of the concerns that people saw in terms of climate change and how they identified those and prioritized those. So we were able to bring together that information um, along with the Energy and Climate Action Committee on their own had done some outreach within the community. And so they were looking to also identify um, priorities and plans for uh, folks within the community and what people saw as um, some of the issues that they felt needed to be addressed more immediately. Um, 
so from that, uh, they identified a project list and created a project list. And from there, we then um, looked to define um, stakeholder groups. And so our process right now is that we've um, we've moved on to uh, doing outreach within the community. And this is where specifically our community engagement consultant has come into play and done quite a bit to reach community members that are either um, um, folks of um, moderate income, low and moderate income, uh, folks who are from the LGBTQ community, um, also folks who are African American descent or Hispanic. So folks within the community that um, have not often been engaged in a lot of the processes uh, within town government. So we were finding a way to sort of do this in a different model. And uh, that process, we've had the first of two meetings, actually the second meeting was literally, I just came from the second meeting now, um, where we broke into four stakeholder groups or task groups. One is looking at land use. The second is looking at renewable energy. The third is looking at buildings. And the fourth is looking at transportation. And each of these groups uh, encompass people that, the, uh, that are identified as community leaders who work with the engagement specialist um, specifically, and then other stakeholders from the community. Some are business owners, uh, some are residents, some are activists, uh, some are involved with uh, not even Amherst residents, but are um, involved within the community uh, by working for businesses that work in town, um, specifically regarding energy. Um, for instance, Lynn Benander from Co-op Power was on tonight's meeting. So we've engaged folks to meet and discuss these specific topics. And so from this, these conversations, we're going to identify projects. There'll be a series of three meetings uh, where we'll then uh, be able to identify projects and tasks from that. And those things will help define how we will move forward with um, putting together the, the climate action adaptation um, resiliency plan. And ultimately, then we'll have a draft of the um, a draft of the plan that we'll then bring to the community and bring to the council and bring to the town manager. And we will be vetting this through um, all different uh, channels and sectors within the town. And we will get uh, feedback, and then revise that plan even further to get to a final draft that will then, once it's finalized, will be brought before the council. So right now, we've actually been um, very much on task and in compliance with our timeline. Um, I don't know if Laura has had the ability to join or not. Um, Hi, Stephanie, so, I'm here. Okay, sorry, I just can't see you, that's all. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so we are very much on task with our timeline. So we did revise it a little bit and I'll let Laura speak to the revisions and why we did so. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, and thank you all for having us. Sorry, I just joined. I'm in the middle of bedtime over here. Um, but yeah, we've been uh, hard at work this summer. I think ECAC has been able to really embrace the virtual meeting platform and we've been moving forward um, with our committee meetings uh, since I think later in April, so for quite a while. Um, we have been, as, as you know, the MVP process is a town grant that, that Stephanie um, and Paul were able to, to get, um, but ECAC has been very heavily involved um, as this is related directly to our work in developing a climate action and resiliency plan and the charge of our committee. Um, so one of the things to Stephanie's point that we've done to help make sure that the MVP work is aligning well with the town timeline is we've um, worked on adjusting the schedule a bit to make sure that we're going to be meeting milestones around the time when the town council will need information from us, such as budget information about projects and budgets. Um, so we will, we plan to, and we also, if you remember, we're tasked in our charge to update the town council regularly and we're planning on sending, submitting a report to you all at the end of the calendar year. And around that time, we'll also have some preliminary information about budget requests that we can incorporate into that, uh, that process. 
So in addition to just doing the climate action plan and moving forward on our goals, I think what the MVP process has, has really shown us is really innovative ways to engage with our community. We're clearly just at the beginning of this, but we're really looking forward to reporting back to the council and to other committees about um, what I hope will be a successful um, community involvement um, with, this, with this plan and this process. Um, it's hard work, I think, you know, but it'll, it's gonna be worth it. And I'm really excited to be able to share those process, that, that feedback with you all. Um, you know, there's, there's so much to show for climate change and equal, equality and the, the connections between how we can both address climate change and, and address equal, equality issues, but also how if we ignore climate change it's going to negatively impact our most vulnerable community members more than everyone else. Um, so we really have a lot of work to do there. Um, and there's also a lot of work happening, you know, around climate change and building back better after COVID. Um, and I think the town, uh, the, I hope that our climate action plan will, will show us ways that we can embrace both of those things uh, in the future. Thank you. Um, again, in the interest of time, I just want to check and see if there's any council questions at this time. They will be coming forward with a more complete report. Darcy. Yes, just um, just very briefly, uh, I just wanted to to thank um, Stephanie and Laura for the great work they're doing um, and and praising them for the amazing process that they've put together for the task forces and the ability to bring together a diverse group of um, community members in a way that that is really cutting edge. It's putting Amherst way out in front um, as far as showing how to um, get a diverse group together to do the decision making. And um, so I won't go on because I know how packed our agenda is, but I really hope that counselors um, will take time to look at the material provided and learn more about the work that the task groups are doing in this um, upcoming month. Thank you. Any other comment at this time? Okay. We're going to take a five minute break and then we're going to come back and immediately go to the next uh, agenda item that we've got on the schedule and that is the issue of the elections. I was visible, but you guys were all kind of like grayed out and so I could still see everybody, but I couldn't hear anything. And so it looked like I was still there, but I wasn't really there. I couldn't hear anything, but I can now. Put you back on. Okay. So let me just start with uh, checking in with people to make sure that you're back on and you can hear us. Uh, Shalini Balmilne? Yes. Alyssa Brewer? Present. Pat DeAngelis? Yes. Darcy Dumont? Yes. Lynn Griesmer is a yes. Mandy Johanneke? Yes. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Evan Ross? Yes. George Ryan? I'm here. Kathy Shane? Yes. Steve Schreiber? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. And Sarah Schwartz? Present. Okay, we're all back and connected. And we are now going to move to the issue of the elections. And I want to ask both Paul and Shabina to give us any updates in particular, uh, some of the issues that they discussed earlier with me uh, about the need to look at these election sites. So Paul? Yeah. So. I don't see Shavina here, but that might be me. He, setting. Picture's I'm there. here. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hello. <laughs> I've got my, my settings are screwed up today. That's so, okay. Um, so thanks. So the proposal that we reviewed last week and um, uh, that um, the council is discussing tonight uh, is, is something that um, the town came up with as a way to 
uh, expedite uh, the voting for everybody, make it clear, make, create clarity for people who are voting. Uh, and there was some, been some comment uh, about our health director. Our health director uh, weighed in on this, is fully supportive of this as being the best way to, is a better way to control the, the spread of the virus. So, uh, and I just clarified that with her, uh, with that, with her today. Um, and I guess the other, there's some, you know, the, the issues we have is that there's some changes that the Secretary of State's uh, office is coming down and, and Shavina is in uh, close contact with them on a daily basis. So Shavina, do you wanna weigh in on the idea of uh, polling locations and being able to, to hold outside polling locations or, or locations in tents? Sure, so um, as Paul stated, I do work closely with the Secretary of State um, because the legislation did pass in July 7th, oh, excuse me, July 6th, we know there was legislation that passed. Um, it expanded um, vote by mail um, and there were a lot of changes that affected elections. Uh, the Secretary of State held a meeting with all of the clerks on last Thursday. Um, Michelle Tassinieri, who is the head legal counsel for the Secretary of State, um, gave us some direction, answered questions and concerns. Um, so regarding uh, elections, um, and I have it here, uh, I want to give everyone a citation. So according to 950 CMR subsection 51, elections must be held inside a public building. And so therefore they cannot be held outside in tents. Um, it was something that many clerks have considered as we are all examining our polling locations statewide. Um, the Secretary of State is looking at all polling locations in all communities. Any polling location that is um, in where there are multiple precincts held in one building, clerks are asked to assess those polling locations. Um, if, social distance, if social distancing can be achieved, we are asked to make those provisions. And if we cannot um, be able to socially distance a precinct, then we have to relocate. Those are the things that um, took played a part in the um, decisions uh, in us looking to move many of our polling locations prior to uh, the change in legislation, we knew that some of our polling locations were unavailable to us. We knew that some of our polling locations um, just in their setup um, was too small to um, accommodate social distancing. Um, earlier today in a conversation, Paul, you particularly mentioned the concern with the schools. And we've received some follow-up questions like, when do the schools actually open? Are they using their gyms uh, for classes? If their gyms are being used, do they have to decontaminate the whole school and shut it down? So could you speak to that? Sure, absolutely. So um, there, there are th maybe three probable locations um, that are things that we would have to consider if the council says, we don't wanna move in this all in one location to look at a different option. So one of those things, uh, we have three polling locations in schools, Fort River, Wildwood, and Crocker Farm. Fort River and Wildwood, we can kind of um, put those off to the side because they're both in gyms and can be set aside. Crocker Farm presents a larger problem because you have to walk through the building to get into the cafetorium, which is where voting occurs. Um, the fact that we have to, initially we were thinking maybe we can use a tent outside because the schools will already have a tent set up most likely there. But with the news that we just learned on Friday that you can't use tents as a voting location and we were worried about that anyway in November, Crocker Farm becomes an issue. Um, and the I think the superintendent and the school committee would expect us to have an industrial de de decontamination of the building uh, prior to re-entry of staff or students at that point in time. So the other two buildings I think we can manage, uh, that one becomes a problem. Um, and, I'm, and none of these are insurmountable, I just wanna be clear about that. So if the council says we wanna keep the polling locations as they are, we will figure out a way make, to make that happen. We suggested this all in one location for multiple reasons. Um, one is you know clarity um, and then the other is to 
comply with the social distancing requirements of COVID-19. And it was something that the previous town clerk had come up with and then Shavina really pulled it together, pulled everybody into a room and said, let's, let's walk through these things and see how they work. The second location that presents a challenge to us is the um, North Amherst Fire Station, which is uh, where, where the voting occurs in the bays. Now the fire chief has been very, from the very beginning, he locked down the two, the two fire stations and the police station to outsiders because of the uh, intense commitment to force protection, which means trying to prevent his staff from getting infected with COVID-19, which causes, if, if they become infected or, or it goes through the police, for, police or fire department, it becomes a real problem for us to be able to deliver public safety services. So he has been very strong about um, keeping his, um, those, those two properties plus the fire station in terms of trying to um, keep the public out of the buildings themselves. Um, so, and that, that's a major thing. The third location is the Bangs Community Center. And as you heard Shavina say, the Secretary of State has asked the clerks to look at any co-located sites, which seems a little bit odd because we're saying, why not the high school? Because there's lots of co-located sites. We're proposing 10, but that seems to meet the threshold of um, the allowance for what the, the um, Secretary of State is saying. Um, and that we would, we would have to, um, examine the Bangs Community Center to determine if we could have co-located sites or if we would have to find a different location for one or two of those sites. If you recall, when you go into the Bangs Community Center to vote, everybody goes in the same door and then you're dispersed into three and it's very tight at that entry point. So how we would maintain, the, the goal would be to maintain uh, six foot uh, separation while you were waiting in line. Uh, we are prepared to have tents for waiting in line at all the locations if that's what we need to do. We're prepared to install benches or seating areas for people who, who might get tired when they're waiting in line, things like that. Um, I think that um, the message to the council is that there's, there's probably going to have to be changes to some of the locations um, and that the town clerk and staff will work with this to make it as um, make sure everybody who wants to be able to vote is able to vote. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Shavina, is there anything else you want to add to that? Yes, I would like to add. So the Secretary of State has um, a staff member who is overseeing all of the polling location uh, changes statewide. So they set out guidelines for clerks to follow. And so from the inception, since we began this proposal, I have been in close contact with her, her name is Bridget. And so I was sending her, I've been in uh, close communication with her and I was sending her um, our site plan, what our thoughts were. Um, and we were able to get the blueprint for the high school that we were able to submit for the secretary of state to say that although we are looking to move 10 precincts into one location, based on the size of the two gyms at the high school, the size of the two gyms allow more than enough space for them to be there outside of a global pandemic, but also to be able to allow for social distancing. Um, we went through um, the traffic patterns, the fact that we will have a single entrance, single exit points where there will be no overlap. Um, and those measures are what have said, you know, the Secretary of State has given us the positive feedback. So those are the things and the thoughts that have already gone in place when we were drafting the proposal. Um, and so that's why we wanted to go with the single location. There were many things that were factored in um, into air quality, move, air movement, things like that. So those things have already, we've already discussed those things. We've already talked over those things. Um, with facilities managers on the town side and on the school side, um, those things have been taken into uh, account. And so I'd like to, you know, to communicate that with everyone. I know that there, there have been many concerns about that. And so those things um, have been addressed. And Shavina, just give us an update on the number of people that you expect to vote in a national election, which is what we have coming up, both September and November, and where we stand in terms of postcards that are returned to date. Sure, 
So as of today, our office um, has postcards totaling uh, 3,804. We also uh, have received 124 vote by mail applications via email or um, what someone has uh, dropped off in our Dropbox, which takes us closer to 4,000, um, excuse me, 4,000 uh, postcards. Um, I'm gonna pull up our turnout rates. I hope I don't lose you. I'm going to try to navigate to get over uh, so that I can provide you with those. Um, so I just wanted to provide everyone with some statistical numbers. Um, so in our state primary in 2016, our voter turnout was 4,668 voters turned out in that election. Um, and then for our presidential election, November 8th of 2016, we had 15,096 voters that turned out to vote. Um, moving into 2012, if we're looking at, if we're gonna compare uh, in September's state primary, 1,957 voters came out to the polls. Uh, and so uh, in the November 2012 presidential primary, excuse me, presidential election, it looks like we had 15,520 voters uh, cast uh, a vote. And then in 20, 2008, in our state primary, 2,206 voters came out to vote. And then in that presidential election on November 4th in 2008, 12,934 voters uh, came out. And I think sometimes when we look at the numbers, it helps us to, um, you know, to put it into perspective because we've already received uh, in, a, in a matter of two weeks, uh, 4,000 postcards that have been returned, um, which means that voters are thinking about um, exercising their right to vote by mail. Currently uh, in the town, um, as of Friday, we have 17,092 registered voters. Thank you for that. Uh, You're welcome. So let's do some council questions and then we will move to public comment. And after that, I think we may, need to, as a council, decide whether we feel uh, it would be best for us to have another council meeting on the 10th, which would be what we have to do at some point because we have to vote uh, by a certain date to establish the election uh, warrant for um, the September 1st election. Kathy? Thank you. Um, let me just turn my, so I don't have to hold it. You're muted, Kathy. I, I'm now muted. Um, I, I, I realize this was proposed with good intentions and with a lot of thought, but even as it was described now, I think what we do know um, from lots of experiences is long lines, waiting times, uh, discourage people from voting. And so we don't know for sure yet. It, we're in the experiment mode on the mail. Um, whether people request it or not. There are quite good studies that minorities, particular Black and African American, are less likely to be willing to vote by mail. So we've got some statements in the report that I don't think are factual. Um, and part of that is a historic distrust of mail, that you, you, you want to put your ballot in a box um, and you think it might not get there on time. And we know there's been a threat. There's a real threat to the mail getting delivered on time, um, coming uh, not from the post office, but from a, a political arm. So there's been a, a lot of uh, people are saying what we need is more, not fewer polling sites um, to make sure that we have fewer number of people because I even think um, the notion that we can space inside, putting a crowd outside in a long line is pe putting people's health at risk. So when I'm looking at the November statistics, if we had 3,000 or 4,000 voting by mail, if they all voted by mail, 11,000 are showing up 
to line up to vote in person. Um, I don't know what uh, Whole Foods or uh, some of the other places that handle crowds, but I know what those lines feel like. And I don't think it's 11,000 all, you know, trying to come in in one day. So there's, I think there's a real concern that we were suppress the vote and we were distort it, that with some people be, uh, just giving up on voting. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, just I'm going to back and forth with the report a little bit. A lot of, it's true that some locations you have to travel to get to your current voting site. But a lot of them are near where people can walk. They can just uh, get there with a quarter of a mile and a half a mile. And when I was looking at distances um, from North Amherst, it's going to be four miles. From South Amherst down on Bay Road, it's five miles. Applewood has a van but they're restricting it to four people in the van at a time. So that is uh, a lot of back and forth. And unless we make a concerted effort to sign them all up for mail, if we had a long wait time outside um, in the heat, the rain, anything else, the elderly aren't, the older people aren't gonna show up. I mean, they're not gonna stand in line for a long period of time. So um, I, I've got an alternative proposal, but you're giving me some sites can't have it because of other reasons like banks. I'm not clear whether we have to reduce to only one at banks or potentially two, but the idea of opening up the high school as an alternative place, um, if we had to move some of bangs in, um, one, two or three, there are three precincts that vote there now, if we literally cannot use the fire station. Thinking of September 3rd as our, our experiment. Um, so only doing this change, whatever changes we do for now, and really study and then have a fact-based uh, deliberation on what did the turnout look like? Do we see any biases by neighborhood? Did we make it harder for some people? And if the grade schools are not open on September 1st, some of this decontamination concern won't be there for the primary. So we can kind of see what that and get a good feeling for what that looks like. And then assess um, whether if you asked for a postcard, filled it out, vote by mail, did you vote by mail? Because there are gonna be some people that are afraid their ballot won't get it there in the time and they're still gonna to wanna to come. So we're getting suggestions from a lot of residents, could we, next time around think of drop off ballot boxes you know where you've got your your ballot and you just bring it and you stick it in uh oregon has it i think colorado has it i know we don't have it now so i think our goal should be protect the health of people but don't suppress the vote and that to me is a smaller number of people potentially at each voting site um not a larger number so uh, I'll stop there. I, I put a written statement in where I found a few citations of Brennan and others on the disparate impact on minorities, but also the impact as people reduce polling sites on what happens to turnout. And Wisconsin had that experience. So I know there was a concern about older poll workers being uh, fearful of being at the polls. So I think we do a full, for, full uh, first to get those, to get some young people there being poll workers. It's never, I've had poll workers who had no previous training that did a perfectly lovely job um, checking me in and handing me my ballot, you know, and no one pronounces my last name right anyway, so I won't worry about that. So I just, I'm really concerned and I think there is a good evidence. So my alternative is to just focus on September. Um, I, open up the high school as a new place, but I, I heard uh, Lynn told me that we can't offer choices. So you're either at one site or at the at another, because I was gonna open up the high school to anyone who wants to go there. But if we can't do that, you know, in some banks, or some or all of the banks precincts go to the high school, because it's not that much further. Um, and then talk more about that. And then, then figure out what happened. Um, if we can still vote at the two churches, uh, see what happens um, there and uh, proceed along those lines. Um, I think this took everyone by surprise. I know when it was last presented to me, I went home when I read this report and I said, where was I oh, two weeks ago? Because <laughs> I clearly was asleep at the wheel. Um, 
alarm bells should have gone off then. So I, I didn't do my due diligence. But I, I really urge us to be not hasty on this. Um, we certainly wouldn't want the impact of lower voter turnout and more crowds and waiting times and people turning away saying, I'm not going to wait out here. Um, whether it's the I think this is an important election. I want everyone who's willing to vote to be easily and safely able to vote. So I'll stop there with that ramble. Um, and I um, like to remind councillors to try to keep their comments to no more than three minutes. Uh, Dorothy, may I offer a response? I'm sorry. Dorothy Pam. Okay, I would like to second the idea that we actually do seek some additional polling places. I, I am concerned, however, in having us meet again on the 10th, and I would need strong assurances that we could get the detailed information out to all the voters exactly where the changes, changed polling places would be. Um, I do think the idea of tents for people in line, um, it, it's a good addition. I totally support the ballot boxes at any polling place that we have, official polling place, because that allows people to go to the one that's nearest to them uh, or the one they're used to going to. Um, I see a lot of problems. Uh, certainly, if I, I'm not prepared to vote yes on this tonight, and certainly not for any plan that would be permanent. We're going to do something for September. And then I think Kathy's right. We're going to look at it and analyze it and say, how can we make this better for November? Um, and then make that vote then. So I, I I understand that this plan was put together with the best of reasons and with a lot of thought, but the response to it is uh, tremendous, tremendously worried and against it. So I think we have got to listen to listen to the people because voting is the most important thing. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Um, well, I guess that I was thinking about two questions. One was uh, in the statistics that were presented for the number of people who voted in the 2016 presidential election, did that include the people who voted early voting and how many, if so, how many people voted early voting in that election? Um, and the other question that I have is uh, going back to the schools issue, because uh, do we know yet whether their intention is to set up the gymnasiums at Fort River and Wildwood for classroom space to allow for um, a re more spacing? And if so, um, what will that do for the November election, in addition to the question of uh, do we have a start date for school um, yet uh, um, scheduled? Okay. Shavina, uh, you might want to go ahead and answer at least the first question, and then I don't know, Paul, if you have any further knowledge on the schools. So the first question, the uh, the results do include the early voting. I didn't. I did not um, manipulate the uh, the search to get it from early voting to um, to actual election day results. But I what I will add is in the March primary this March in our presidential primary, 363 voters requested an absentee ballot, and this is pre-pandemic, pre-mail-in vote and 320 of those 363 returned their ballot. So that is an indication of how voters uh, respond. So when a voter requests that we, in our town, when a voter requests a ballot, they return their ballot, they cast their ballot. Um, and so with us having uh, nearly 4,000 um, vote by mail applications in our office, we can um, make a, a, a clear um, assumption that those ballots will be returned to us. Um, I also would like to add, we've ordered a ballot box. It'll be here before the September 1st that will go, it'll be a freestanding secure ballot box that will go on the main street side of town hall. Also the distance from the nearest uh, bus stop to the high school is about a quarter of a mile as well. And PBTA has agreed 
to assist in creating a travel plan for any uh, voters who will take the PVTA bus to the high school if the um, proposal passes. I spoke to Paul um, at PVTA on Friday. If you want me to weigh in, the high school will not be in session the way I understand it on September 1. Uh, and staff are, I believe, are expected to be back on September 1 for the elementary schools, but students are not expected to be back. And do you know when students will be back for the elementary school? Well, I don't think they've actually made that final decision yet. There's lots of different plans out there, but I don't know off the top of my head. Um, and do you know whether they're planning to use their gyms for classrooms? I don't. I can find that out, though. Okay. George, you have your hand up. A question for Savina. Um, if I understand you correctly, um, the high school as a potential location has been vetted thoroughly by the Secretary of State as meeting all the requirements for COVID-19, um, and that's set. But no other, our traditional 10 polling places, 10 uh, sites or whatever, are not. And so they would all have to pass some kind of state inspection or review. And it's clear that there are some that probably won't or can't. And so from your perspective, there's just enormous uncertainty about where um, you can even have voting locations. So part of the logic behind this proposal is actually to be clear to the voters early on that this is where they will go and that's it that's that's and that solves that issue so i guess my question for you is these the other the sites we normally use don't they have to be if we're going to use them they have to be examined by the state and meet all the various requirements for covid 19 before you can say they can be used that is correct and so that's our biggest problem is with the bangs because um the it, there's three precincts in there. And so two of those precincts, we can't um, accommodate for social distancing. So we would have to find two other locations. Um, while we can reduce the amount of booths, and yes, we can have uh, voters wait in a line outside at our other site, um, that, that particular location would still create um, a need or necessity for us to find another location. Um, and then with us not being able to use the, um, the North Fire Station, we'd also have to find another location. So that would be three precincts that we'd have to find in addition to Crocker Farm. So now we're up to four um, locations that we'd have to relocate um, anywhere. And I would think that would create enormous confusion amongst the voters. And It would uh, cause a great deal, yes. And I think the greatest threat of suppression of voting is the simple fact you don't know where you're supposed to vote. And that's what the issue seems to be here. And uh, this is not an ideal solution, but we're not in an ideal situation. And I think the most important thing is that for anyone who wants to vote physically, um, they know where exactly the one place is and that's it. And it seems to me it would be prudent for many people, uh, especially those who are concerned about COVID-19 um, to vote by mail. And we're already working very hard to make that possible. We've gotten very positive response um, so uh, I'm really struggling with some of the arguments I've heard earlier that somehow this is some uh, attempt to suppress the vote. It seems, in fact, that the vote will most likely be suppressed if we don't follow this plan because people will be absolutely confused about where they're supposed to go. And by the time they figure it out, it'll be much too late. Uh, Shalini. Um. Yes, I just, uh, we had a district five meeting and I just wanted to again share that most people were very against this for several reasons that have already been stated. Um, one of the things that was really important is that even if we have PVTA or public transportation that's doing the shuttles for people, people don't know about that. So, and that's the hard part is how do we let people know? So the confusion about where, where to vote and how to get there, even if we solve these logistical issues, the important gap is always in how do we let people know that this is happening. Uh, so that's a big gap. And then um, I'm, and I think there was a little confusion about 15,000, maybe not 15, let's say half of the people vote uh, online 
but they're going to be standing in a line, like 8,000 people standing in a line wait, waiting to vote, How what that's going to look like, and how will the precincts be divided within the school? So there was a question around that. And I think one of the suggestions was to just have three places, like in North, Central, and South. So to have three polling. And the last thing is, even if we do go ahead with this, it needs to be uh, a temporary thing just for this year, not a permanent change. If I miss anything, Darcy, do add to that. Thank you. Um, okay, Steve Schreiber. Yeah, so I just wanted to mention the, I mean, others have said this, but what a remarkable thing that we actually have 4,000 polling places right now, basically people's mailboxes. First time in, first time in history that we've had that many polling places. So we really need to keep that in context that really the effort is to keep people away from the actual physical polling place, trust the mail, I still trust the mail, and no matter what what's said or no matter what effort it is to take away your right to mail, who can believe that we're actually saying that? But um, so far it's been working for me. The other thing is the more choices, and I think Councilor Ryan said this to a certain degree, but the more choices you give people the more likely it is for people to go to the wrong place. So we are the informed, and a lot of the letter writers are the informed. You know, the people that show up at your district meetings, the people that write you letters, these are people that are paying attention. And these are people that will know where to vote. And these are often also people that have a long history of voting. But that's a very, that's a subset. There are lots of people that are new to town, you know, particularly in a presidential primary year. Maybe they're students, just maybe they're new to town for other reasons they often go to the wrong polling place. So that to me is a form of voter suppression. You show up at Wildwood, you're supposed to vote at Bang Center. You don't have a car, it's raining out, you're finished, you're not gonna vote. Or you might vote a provisional ballot at Wildwood, that vote won't be counted. Or maybe, maybe the um, town clerk can correct me on that. But that to me, the more choices you give, actually the more chance for error you introduce. And so my other comment is that there literally is no place in Amherst other than the old Bertucci's that is better served by public transportation than the high school gym. So every stop in Amherst either stops at that stop in front of, every bus in Amherst either stops at that bus stop near Bertucci's or the UMass circulator buses um, turn the corner onto East Pleasant Street and they stop right in front of where the Bank of America ATM building is. So if you're taking a UMass circulator route or if you're taking one of the more long distance PVTA routes, they all stop within a third of a mile of the high school gym. So I think having a single polling place, I totally get having 10,000 people wait in line is a terrible idea. But on the other hand of clarity of people understanding that, oh, it's an election, let's go vote at the high school is, is um, actually helps, actually helps and franchise the Okay. Mandy Joe Haneke, you have your hand up. And I also want to mention that uh, Superintendent Dr. Mike Morris has offered to join to answer questions about the schools. And he's uh, coming in um, as soon as he gets the right link. Uh, Mandy Joe. Thank you. Um I've struggled with this decision um, and I'm still struggling with it, but I want to clarify a couple of things and hopefully that our town clerk can us. She just mentioned that there will be a drop off box. So I, I want to know how many there will be. It sounds like there might only be one, but that means that anyone who requests a mail in ballot can actually drive at any time from the time they receive that ballot until election day to drop it off in that box. So they don't have to rely on mail. So I want to confirm that that is correct um, because I think that's huge. Um, I want to confirm that if we do consolidate all into the high school, it will operate similar to how the banks was operated, which is that once you enter the first gym, there will be 10 lines of people, one for each precinct, um, not one line with one check-in table for all however many thousand might decide to go to the polls in person that day. Because um, again, I think that's a, a big concern. Um, and then I'm curious about this electronic poll books. I did a lot of reading and a consolidation of all of our precincts into one location such that anyone who is voting can vote at that location. Um, as Steve was just saying, 
um, is something that actually many states are moving to um, because of that convenience of ease of knowing where to vote without having to know exactly what precinct you're in um, to do that. Um, this one might operate slightly differently. So I'm curious whether we are allowed to operate multiple of these vote centers um, or even one with electronic poll books where it doesn't matter what table you check in at. Um, that, that all 10 or 12 or 15, however many check-in tables we might have, can take any voter. Um, such that we could maybe operate two vote centers, one at the high school and one somewhere else maybe, and I would have no idea where that could be, where all voters can go. It sounds like though that that is not an option um, in Massachusetts at this time. And if that's not an option, our option is to designate a location for each precinct. Um, and then we run into the problem that at least half our, almost half our precincts are changing locations. Um, no matter what it sounds like. And so what do we do with that? It seems like advertising for one location where everyone goes is a bit easier to get the name across and the place across than four, pe four sets of precincts are changing um, and trying to have just those figure it out. Um, I was struck when I was looking at PBTA lines that all of Hampshire College is not served by a bus to their current voting polling location, which is the Munson Library. All students at Hampshire College must somehow have a car or find a ride to get to Munson because there is no bus that takes them to their polling place. Whereas if we move that polling location to say the high school, there is a bus that takes them within a quarter mile because as Steve said, all buses go within a quarter of a third mile. So if you were taking a bus to your polling location already, you can still hop on that bus and get to the high school. And I think that's huge. Um, we could, I, I think the advertising and the knowledge is solvable. Um, I was concerned when I read the CDC guidelines uh, because they recommended more polling places, not less. Um, so I am a little less worried about that now that our public director of public health, Julie Fetterman has signed off on this and believes that this is better, um, it still concerns me. Um, so I guess the only other thing I wanna say is I don't think I can vote for anything that might change after September. I think we need a plan for both September and November because if we're changing polling places and we get everyone on board in September, we don't wanna have to change it again in November and try and re-educate everyone else. That makes it even harder. I'm okay with and maybe it's wise to whatever we do for these elections be for September and November, but then revisit it in January and February when we're maybe through or can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but I don't think we should be doing anything between September and November, whatever we decide should be for both. Maybe a couple questions. Um, did you want me to answer her question? Please. Okay, okay sure. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your comments and concerns. So our the Dropbox that we ordered, it's one Dropbox. That Dropbox can accommodate a little over 16,000 ballots. I went with the middle of the, of the road size Dropbox. Um, and then as far as the precincts and lines, so we would have moving the polling locations to the high school we have to maintain the 10 separate precincts so there would be 10 separate lines between the two gyms so they would not be just in the main gym we would utilize both gyms um, and so that's how we get to do the social distancing as well um, in addition with the e-poll books when i when we were in our meeting last week i clarified so the e-poll books will be uh they're programmed to be precinct specific However, they will expedite the check-in process because it's easy to just type in three letters of a uh, voter's last name and first name versus having to flip through pages to find their street, go down that whole entire street and look for a voter's name. So the use of the, uh, the, use of the poll books and the reason that poll books passed in legislation and they were certified on Friday um, was to, in a hope to, to reduce 
voters having to be in a line if they opt to uh, vote in person. And um, lastly, I agree um, in, in evaluating all of our polling locations, um, it was the, you know, it was my intent to have something in place that would cover both of these elections. I, I believe I mentioned this in the original um, July 20th um, proposal. Um, when I first came on, Paul and I discussed moving polling locations and it was never um, our decision or thought to change polling locations in 2020. Um, and, and from a professional standpoint, moving a polling location in a state and federal year is kind of like election suicide. However, um, because uh, we're in a global pandemic, we have to respond. It's always better to move a polling location in a local election year because it's slower. You have, um, it's, and I hate to use this term, but it's just the facts. Um, local elections are less popular. And so voters can get acclimated to the change. When you're, because we have so many elections in a state and federal election year, they're popular. And so we try to reduce any confusion for the voters and we try to keep um, things the status quo. So we were already planning to evaluate polling location changes for 2021. However, we have to respond to the global pandemic and thus that's why it's before us now and time is truly of the essence. Thank you, Shavina. Evan, you have your hand up. Yeah, so I think much like Mandy, I struggled with this. I, I think I left our last meeting saying, okay, this makes sense. And then we started getting uh, quite a bit of constituent correspondence and that caused me to reflect on this a bit more. And I actually really appreciate this conversation that we're having because um, it's helping shape where I'm at, especially some of the comments from uh, George and Steve and from Mandy. Um, because one of the things that I think is important to note a lot of the emails we've been getting have been saying, keep things the way they are, keep the polling places where they are. And what we're hearing is that's not possible. Some polling locations are going to have to move. And that gets me thinking to, there's going to be some people who are lucky enough to keep their polling location and others who are going to have to figure out where their new polling location is. And there's going to be different new polling locations all around town. And I think that actually has the potential to create a lot of confusion. Anytime we move a polling place, you create confusion. And so it's great if we never have to do it, but it's clear that we do have to do it. Um, and so I'm, I'm coming around to what I'm hearing from, from Mandy saying, if some people's polling locations are gonna have to move, if we have to already educate some people about their new polling locations, it's easiest to say, everyone is going to vote in the same place. I think that actually it creates a lot of simplicity. Um, you know, in the 2018 election, I remember we had uh, early voting on campus and I had a student in my class who missed it. And she told me at the end of class, she was going to go vote. And I said, great, where's your polling location? She said, oh, I'm just going to vote at the student union. I said, no, no, that was just early voting. And she said, well, I don't know where to vote then. And so I sat with her and we put her address in, which was a little weird teacher asking her address, but we put it in, we found her polling location and she said, oh, I'm not going. Um, and I said, well, why? And she goes, this is too much work. This is too much hassle. And I, and I think that's an important thing that was brought up by, by Steve, which is that um, low propensity voters, anything that creates confusion, anything that makes it that much harder, don't turn out. I, I mean, when I was running, you know, I had a student who called me, I think it was a student who said, um, are you offering rides to the polls? Because it's raining out and I'm not going to walk to the polls in the rain. And so we got them to vote. Because we got them a car. And so thinking about this in terms of reducing barriers and reducing confusion, I've come around to the idea that actually the least amount of confusion would be to send a message to everyone in town that this year, everyone is voting in the same place. Um, I really appreciate Kathy's creative thinking. I, I, I also appreciate as a scientist, the idea of gathering evidence and making decisions. However, we know that voting patterns are sticky. We're already changing some stuff around. I can't imagine the confusion if people vote in a different place from the primary to the general. I think that, that'll actually make the situation worse. So I don't think I can support that. Um, and so I, I think that as far as creating confusion, I think this makes sense. The one last thing I wanna say is we keep hearing um, this idea of like, oh, well, if 8,000 people show up, can you imagine 8,000 people in line 
like, come on, guys. The polls are open for 13 hours, right? And I just checked, 1,200 people voted in my polling location in 2018. And um, I was the only person in the gym when I went to cast the vote for myself, right? Because that doesn't mean 1,200 people are going to stand in line. It's spread out over um, 13 hours. And the last point I want to make, because I know we're trying to make this brief, is that spreading out, we're focused so heavily right now on geography, spreading out geographically. But I think that our focus really needs to be as a council and, and as a uh, government, how we can spread out over time. So how can we, one, on election day, get people to come at different times? And I don't know if there's some way to do it where we say, hey, polling location's busy right now. Maybe try you know, later if you have the ability to do so. Um, like some gyms are like, it's busy, don't come now. Um, two, getting as many people to vote by mail as possible. And three, getting as many people to early vote as possible because early vote is always much slower. And I'm actually wondering if it makes sense to add early vote locations more than it makes sense to add election day locations um, because those are always great because much like we're talking about now, I've early voted on campus, I've early voted at town hall. Anyone can early vote at any location, that's sort of the beauty. Um, and, I, and I hope that's what we move towards in the future is the ability for anyone to vote at any location. Because I think the days of precinct polling locations, um, we really need to move past those because they only create confusion. So this is, I think like every thing in this pandemic, whether it's UMass reopening or schools, there is no ideal solutions, right? We have a whole bunch of unideal solutions, but I've come around to the idea that the, the most straightforward way to get people to vote, given that we cannot keep our current locations, is to just say everyone votes here this year. Thank you, Evan. Darcy, I'm gonna take your question and then go to Mike Morris, okay? Darcy, please unmute. Darcy, you need to, okay. Sorry. Um, uh, I just wanted to <clears throat> respond to um, Evan's statement that um, it seems like the most, the least confusing thing to do would be to keep things as much as they are now. That would be the least confusing thing to do. Um, and I think I heard the town manager say that we could keep our current polling stations except for the bang center, which Kathy's motion actually deals with the possibility of moving those um, polling stations to the high school. Um, and the high school could be that alternate um, polling station. I guess I feel like um, we've heard from a lot of people in the last two weeks, and I don't think I've gotten one email from anyone who said, yes, let's, let's change to one polling station. They've pretty uniformly been opposing doing the, doing the change. So I'm kind of surprised that we're not listening to the residents and what they're almost uniformly saying in all their messages to us. Um, I do feel sheepish about my reaction two weeks ago, <laughs> which was um, support for the idea, but after having our district meeting in District 5, um, I, I do feel like um, there was a tremendous backlash and that we should be listening to our constituents. Um, and we should, uh, so I'm leaning heavily to support Kathy's motion. Um, although I've always additionally supported having a polling place at UMass also. Um, and I think that we could manage if we had to make a change just for September and evaluate it. Um, and I definitely don't want to make a permanent change this year. Dorothy, I'm, I'm going to skip for a moment and uh, ask Mike to talk about the impact of voting in general at the schools, elementary schools, and specifically this year. Mike, thanks for joining us. 
I have not been watching tonight, so I am coming in uh, without the information of the last couple hours in the dialogue. So I apologize. Uh, we've got our own set of meetings, multiple meetings this week. So I, uh, I apologize that I wasn't tuning in, but um, Paul and I spoke early this morning and um, a couple of things to note. One is that uh, based on uh, tonight, tomorrow night, the school committee will be considering phasing models, basically when students start in-person learning uh, the short story is they all the models essentially phase in much more a higher percentage of students at the elementary level than the secondary level. Um, in terms of the specific locations you all are discussing at the high school at um, at Fort River and at Wildwood, the nice thing is that there is a separate entrance that uh, voters who come in do not have to enter anything any part of the school except for the gymnasium. You know I have talked to the town manager about industrial strength cleaning that could happen. Uh, the, the reality is for our schools, we are not allowing, and nor is any school in Massachusetts, visitors into our buildings, including parents, guardians. So I will say that I've gotten feedback of how unusual it would be to have the strictest rules around visitors that we've ever had in the history of schools, and then for one day go the opposite direction. And that is making staff in the schools very uncomfortable. Um, it is making custodian staff, as well as other staff, very uncomfortable. Uh, that we're building in uh, incredible safeguards for student and staff safety, and somehow those don't go away. So again, the nice thing at the high school is there won't likely won't be too many students at the high school um, at that time, and the use of the gym is less essential. Um, if Fort River and Wild were reused, it's a little more problematic because the quantity of students in the school. Crocker Farm is our large problem, and, and it will continue to be a large problem. And I won't speak for the school committee, I only speak for myself. But the only way that voting happens at Crocker Farm is people entering the school. Um, and our plans now, based on state guidance, is that we would have our youngest students there, our preschool students, our kindergarten, and first grade, and that's right where down where the voters would enter. Uh, it will make our school community very uncomfortable, in my opinion, uh, to have voters there one day, uh, ending at seven or eight at night, and then our youngest students coming into the building 12 hours later. Um, no matter what cleaning can go on. Um, as opposed to the other schools, there's not a good way to, this terrible phrase, but I'm tired and I wasn't expecting to be on this meeting, so I apologize. There's no way to quarantine where the voting area is into an external space like there is at the high school, there is at Fort River, there is at Wildwood. So in my personal opinion, I have significant concerns about voting happening at Crocker Farm because of the, um, there is no way to sort of cordon off, that's probably a more appropriate term, uh, where the voters would be located uh, in that site. And I think this was a concern that we heard from our community members for years and years and years uh, before COVID about the safety of voting at Crocker Farm, just because this, voters have to enter uh, the full uh, building in order to go in. And in a, in a, during a COVID world, I think it, it is something that I have significant concerns about Certainly I can bring to the school committee to get their opinion about that, but Crocker Farm is really a different animal than the other schools because of the architecture and the structure of where voters would go. I wanna acknowledge that the people who had safety concerns in the past about Crocker Farm, I agreed with. Uh, you know, school committee did some advocacy uh, with the town to remove, potentially remove voting uh, or to at least provide uh, additional support for voting at Crocker Farm. Um, but there were significant concerns pre-COVID and, and while they're not coming up apparently here, I do want to acknowledge that um, that they um, it, it is a major concern. School is closed that day. I want to be really clear. Um, but with voting ended at eight o'clock, based on our safety protocols, we would certainly have to have school closed for multiple days that week. Uh, and it would be awkward because it would just be for Crocker Farm. Uh, so it, it leads to a, a multitude of issues for us. Uh, because of that site, we've looked at other parts and other areas of Crocker Farm uh, where it could be held, but they're not accessible the way they need to be um, for all voters. And that was a problem. Um, so that's more than I plan to say, but I do have some really strong feelings on the topic, particularly as it relates to Crocker Farm. And I'm happy if there's any counselors who want to have questions for me. Uh, great. If not, I'll go on my merry way. Okay. Thanks, Mike. We're not done. Alyssa, you have your hand up and have not spoken yet. And then I do want to give the public an opportunity since we gave them a time specific and we've exceeded that time. Right. And 
we have exceeded that time and I was gonna see if you wanted to have people ask questions of Mike, but if he can hang out for a few minutes, maybe then great, I'll go ahead, so thank you. Um, for those who are concerned that we're not listening to our constituents, we are listening to our constituents, but in fact, and, and, and I say this in the kindest possible way, but being a leader is hard. And it doesn't mean you just add up the number of emails and the number of public comments and you say, oops, that's clear public sentiment. Guess we got to go with that. We're more than that. People expected more than that from us when they elected us to this position. Otherwise, you could just run a poll for everything and we wouldn't have a purpose. So I want to make sure just to say things that are slightly different than other people have said, because all these concerns are very real, obviously. And I just want to emphasize that again, I'm trying to make the best of a bad situation. We can't do UMass right now. I helped set up UMass in 2016. We can't do UMass right now when they're having the only people on campus or people who've signed an agreement about their global pandemic behavior. It would not be appropriate for us to drag a bunch of people in there for one or more multiple early voting days. Our job and our partner at UMass's job and Hampshire, which as Mandy just pointed out, is not even on the bus line right now for voting, and Amherst College is to get everybody to vote by some means necessary. And the easiest way to do that, I still believe, is the way by listening to the expertise of our town clerk, by listening to the expertise of the other people she worked with. Yes, I'm well aware there are studies out there about suppression of votes. I'm well aware that there are people standing in line in other states that don't run their elections as well as we do. And we don't wanna see that happen. And that's why we're talking about tents and benches and the way that we'll facilitate the lines. This is making the best of a bad situation. Let's also remember that our neighbors in Greenfield, South Hadley, Belcher Town, they've been voting in one place for years. It's not a problem. This is not an insane thing to do. It is a very appropriate thing to do in response to this particular situation. I totally agree with taking out the permanent change, right? After we learn from these two elections, we will learn, have learned a lot. We don't know if vote by mail is going to continue to be a thing. We don't know a lot of things. But we can do a better job by taking this seriously right now. I would much prefer that we voted tonight after we hear some more public comment than waiting another week because all we're doing by waiting another week is losing another week of opportunity to educate all of our voters and to find our way into every social service agency, every precinct, every time, tell people why we made the decision and how we're doing our best to get them to the polls rather than arguing over the semantics of one particular thing that happened somewhere else. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to move to public comment and have a show of hands of those people who would like to public comment on this issue. Okay. Um, at this time, I'd like you to limit your public comment, if at all possible, to two minutes, but understand that you may not be able to. We will start with Jeff Mauser. Hello, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I live on, on a Ridgecrest Road. I think it's Precinct 1 now. It was 3. Um, it, my and I've been listening to this conversation and my overall thought around this is that if a lot of people in the town are saying that this is going to be more challenging for them to vote, it's, they're the one, and we're talking about voter suppression, like if people are saying this is going to be a problem for them, that's really important to listen to. And I'm, I've heard the logistical issues around some of the polling places, but I, no, I think having as many polling places being the same as possible is it would be a, like my first preference. If not, you know, with with clear information for those three or four sites that that can't do it that uh, through uh, the newspaper notifications and flyers to have that all be in the high school and have something other than that, but. You know, I, I know you all are thinking of this through, and I definitely agree with um, Mandy Joe of whatever is happening for September needs to happen for November to keep, you know, it's, it's going to be hard enough. People will learn the hard way, unfortunately, whatever is happening now for um, during the primary, 
But if people are really saying, we don't want this to happen, they're, they're saying it because it's going to make it more difficult for them. And they're not just saying it because of the logistics, but it's, it is about getting as many people to the polls as possible. So I think that's really important. So I will end my comment there. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for your comments. Gabrielle Davila, please feel free to correct my pronunciation of your name and state where you live. Uh, hi, my name is Gabriel Davila. I live in District 5. Thank you for agreeing to take my comment. First, I'd like to thank my representatives from District 5. I was really happy with the way that you received our feedback, and I appreciate you representing us well. Um, one thing before I really get into it is that while Hampshire isn't on the PVTA bus line, and there's no PVTA bus lines going from Hampshire College to the Munson Library, that's why Hampshire College provides their own buses to their students who want to vote in Massachusetts elections. So I don't think that should be a big concern. Um, secondly, I'd like to say on the topic of confusing voters by having too many voting locations, I would first, I would never accuse the people on this panel of intentionally moving to suppress the vote, but when votes are intentionally suppressed and proven to have been intentionally suppressed, it's never done by expanding polling locations. It's always done by closing down polling locations or enacting strict voter ID laws. So, and in terms of confusion, while it might seem like the least confusing thing to do is to have everyone vote at the same place, I think it makes more sense that the least confusing thing to do is to close the least amount of polling places so the least amount of people have to move to a different place. In addition, while it's true that voting is open for 13 hours, uh, voting is on Tuesday, so most people are going to be working for those hours. So it's likely that there will be a long line. Long lines are hard enough to drive people away from voting, and that's in years where there isn't a global pandemic that's extremely serious. So I really want to thank the people from District 5 for um, reflecting our views well. Um, I would also urge you to vote on the 10th so that you can take in more feedback from the people you represent. And I think that um, in, in terms of town level community, I especially do appreciate it when the representatives are willing to listen to what people are saying. I'd also like to make the point that in terms of voting and uh, voter stoppage from lines, it impacts working class people disproportionately and people of color disproportionately because they are working more hours during the day, especially on a work day. So thank you for taking my comment and I urge you to make the right decision. Thank you for your comment. Um, Myra Ross, please state your name and where you live. You need to unmute, Myra. Can we assist her, um, Serge? I've uh, I've asked to her to unmute, but I'm not sure if she's by her computer. There we go. You're unmuted. Okay, I'm unmuted. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you, Myra. Didn't work the way it was supposed to. Um, I agree with the previous speaker and I agree with Kathy Shane's position. I'm really worried about the line outside, although it will be broken into 10 lines inside, it will be one line outside. It will be a very long line. We don't have enough data about how many people are really going to vote in person. We know very little about primary elections, for example, the 2016 figure that was given uh, there was really no primary, state primary there. This is the first one that's been very big. And we don't know how many people are going to vote. We do know that a lot of people will vote by mail, but not everybody will vote for, by mail. And if putting them all in one place is a problem. I think that when you have fewer places rather than more places, it does look like you're suppressing the vote, even though you are not intending to suppress the vote. If Wildwood and Fort River are doable and Munson Library is doable and one precinct voting at um, the banks is doable, that's four. Um, and the, if you are going to put maybe two in one of the gyms, that's six and two in another gym, and you can use two different doors to do that. I know the building. There is also a music room that is right by a door and it could be used for voting, it's big enough. And there is a cafeteria that is right by a door. And none of those lines would converge on each other. So the lines would be a lot shorter. So I think you can 
displace the fire station and two of the banks and maybe one of the churches and or Crocker Farm and use the high school and not really endanger people's health. I think you're not ready to vote on this yet. I think it's a little more complicated um, than than um, you know than it than it appears at first. And I really think that it's important to maintain the health and to and to make it as easy as people can. You vote in where the place that you used to vote in, and you don't because we can't use that place anymore. For the people who can't, they get a robocall, they get an, a mailing, they get all kinds of information that says this is where you vote now, and the rest of the people vote where they used to vote. So thank you for doing this. This isn't easy, but I think it's really important that we, yes, encourage people to vote by alternative means, but make it really easy for people to not feel like they're going to endanger their health. And I'll try to unmute or, or mute, sorry. Thank you for your comment, Myra. Um, Jose Lugo. Jose, I forgot to mention this, but you can also decide if you wanna let it see your picture. Um, that's your decision. Please state your name and where you live. Serge, is there a problem? Uh, as far as I can tell, uh, Jose is not muted, so I'm not sure. Jose, can you hear us? Jose? All right, um, I'm gonna suggest that we go on and, and Jose, maybe you can please get back in line because we would like to hear, oh, now you're unmuted, now you're muted, but now you're unmuted. No, now you're muted. Can you unmute Jose? I've just asked uh, Jose to unmute. Okay. Jose, can you hear us? All right. We, okay, we seem to be having a difficulty at this time. Um, Carol Gray, you're next. So let's go to you. Okay. By the way, there's no way for us to show our picture. We just get the option to put on our mic. So I don't know. Thank you. Um, so I'll start with John Lewis. One of the last things he said that was commented on in his funeral was this is the most important election ever, the presidential election. I'm going to be very candid. What you're proposing is draconian. This is what Republicans are doing all across the country. You're proposing eliminating 90% of voting polls in an election year that couldn't be more, the most important election of any of our lifetime by far. Uh, that some, I also find some of the language and discussion a bit Orwellian uh, because there may be three, possibly four sites that have to be relocated. People are saying that, okay, maybe 40% of the people will be lost, but it would be more efficient to have 100% of the people lost. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, in addition, Ms. Brewer commented that the CDC is saying that you should have more polling sites. I don't know why any local public uh, health official would go against the CDC. That's part of the problem with the whole country is states are not listening to the CDC. We should absolutely be listening to the CDC, creating more sites, not fewer. Also, if you read the uh, CDC's instructions, they say to think about completely things that, that you're not talking about yet. Consider drive up voting for eligible voters if allowed in the jurisdiction. Uh, where possible in your jurisdiction, offer alternative voting options for voters with symptoms, those who are sick or known as COVID-19 positive. Post signs to discourage anyone with symptoms from entering the polling location buildings. These things need to be talked about and you should read the CDC guidelines on polling stations. Um, you're, 
I thought there was going to be an alternative proposal tonight that would keep the voting polls exactly what they are. I'd actually like to see a proposal next time to increase the number of voting stations. That UMass is not being allowed to do early voting. It's critical to have a site there, I think, with students. Why not look to non-public buildings? Ask banks, public libraries, Amherst College to open up their spaces. Uh, in addition, you should be plugging for poll workers. Uh, I, know, I know that they're looking for people, but offer training. Call for volunteers if you're short on the budget. I would volunteer if they were a plexiglass. Crocker Farm, um, I, I vote at Crocker Farm. It's one of the easiest polling sites as I can imagine. You walk in a side door, walk up three steps, and walk 10 yards, and the, and the room is on the left. I don't see why that couldn't work well with schooling. Um, in terms of voter suppression, this is absolutely voter suppression. In Atlanta, they reduced the number of polling sites dramatically. People waited for three hours. Um, you can't have people outside waiting for three hours. It's November. People will get cold. Um, also, the Atlantic uh, magazine had um, a an article entitled The Voting Disaster Ahead. One of the things it said was that Georgia, Virginia, and Massachusetts have reported record turnout for their primary elections and will probably see double or triple that in the general. So you have to be prepared for that. You should absolutely have at least the 10 different sites, relocate the four that you have, um, that you have to relocate. But um, it's just also mail-in ballots. So the Atlantic also reported that uh, in 2016, the United States Election Assistance Commission reported that more than 300,000 mail-in ballots were rejected. If a voter forgets to sign the ballot envelope, if they sign the envelope but the signature does not match the one on file, or if the elections office misreads information, many mail-in votes are tossed out. And the studies from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund said that the proportion of of votes that are tossed out that are mail-in votes uh, are more ask you to wrap up please yes thank you i was going with the three minutes because that's what the, the online information said people who are people of color have their votes rejected at a higher percentage i think you're going in completely the wrong direction and this is a perilous time to do this and there's no way that you're going to increase voting by eliminating nine percent of the voting sites this is draconian don't help the republicans please, please reject this. I mean it. I mean, this is exactly what Republicans are doing all across the country. Please don't do this. Thank you. Meg Gage, you're up. Thank you. I'll be very brief because I've written to you and I trust that at least most of, of you read what I wrote or some of you. Um, Who is this? It's me. <laughs> my husband just yelled, who's speaking now? <laughs> C'est moi. Um, I don't think this is draconian. I think the town clerk has tried to deal with very real challenges and difficulties with at least some of our polling places. But I don't think the solution is to change voting for everyone. Our polling place in District 1 hasn't been mentioned. It works perfectly fine. Uh, and I think we need to solve the problem we have and not take a problem and then solve something bigger. Uh, if Bangs is a problem, then let's have everybody at Bangs vote at the high school. That's an easy message. Everybody who used to vote at Bangs now votes at the high school. There were some things in the, rep the report on this proposal that just totally didn't make sense and I don't think helped the case, which for example, if there's needed, there was an outbreak and there needed to be contact tracing, it would be easier if it had all happened at the high school. It doesn't make sense. If there were more people, the contact tracing would be easier. It's just totally counterintuitive. Maybe there's some sense to that, but it, somebody needs to explain it. I don't want to repeat what I said in my memo that I sent to you today, but I strongly urge you to take some kind of middle path. We know it will suppress the vote. We know it will suppress the vote to have everybody voting in a different place, showing up at the wrong place, not having the energy to figure it out. Maybe they'll read a sign on the door of the North Amherst community building that says, go to the high school. But we'll, we will have much less turnout. I don't think 
Amherst, Massachusetts is gonna determine the presidential vote, uh, which of course we're all worried about. Well, many of us are, but I do think we nonetheless want to have our voting be, have as much integrity as possible. I hope that was two minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Meg. Uh, John, Bonifaz, please yes, state your name you. where you live. Yes, thank you. My name is John Bonifaz. I live at 30 Harris Street in Amherst. I serve as the co-founder and president of Free Speech for People, which is a national nonprofit legal advocacy organization fighting to defend our democracy and our constitution. We've been around for more than a decade. I have practiced voting rights law for more than 25 years. Free Speech for People is currently engaged in key voting rights cases in several states, including cases in Pennsylvania and Texas on behalf of the NAACP state conferences of each state, challenging unsafe and unequal voting conditions. A primary focus of those cases is to ensure that the states expand rather than reduce polling locations, especially in the midst of this pandemic. The plan to consolidate all polling locations to the high school is however well-intentioned, extremely misguided and ill-informed. Counselor Haneke helpfully highlighted how the CDC says we should be expanding, not reducing polling locations. I would just add to that that we issued a report in April of this year entitled Safe Voting During the COVID-19 Pandemic. We issued that with infectious disease expert, Dr. Joy Mukherjee, who is a professor at Harvard Medical School, physician at Brigham Women's Hospital, and the Partners in Health Chief Medical Officer. She also happens to be on our board. That report stated as one of the key guidelines that we should be expanding, not reducing polling locations to ensure that we're having less people at each polling site so as to minimize the risk of transmission of the virus. Councilor Ross says, well, you know, 1,200 people and he was there and nobody was there. Put 8,000 people in the middle of a pandemic, it increases the risk of the transmission of the virus. From a public health perspective, this proposal to consolidate all polling locations to one place makes no sense. From a voting rights perspective, it makes no sense. We work with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, with the NAACP, with hundreds of other groups all over the country. We're part of the National Election Protection Coalition. I know of no other voting rights expert in this country who thinks we should be reducing polling sites as a way to help people vote. I know of none of those groups in that coalition who endorse the idea that we should be restricting the number of polling sites, we should be expanding. It's uniform in the voting rights community that that's the standard we should be applying for. But don't just listen to any of that, to Councilor Brewer's point that we've listened to the experts. How about listening to an expert who actually has studied the impact of closing polling locations on voter turnout? Mark Meredith is a professor of political science at the University of Pennsylvania. He's a leading expert on this very question. He happens to be an expert in our case in Pennsylvania that we're about to file a 41 page affidavit that he's drafted for us. And here are his conclusions in three short, short points that he makes. Number one, after studying this and on top of all the other scholarship he has, number one, the cost of in-person voting, when he talks about cost, it's not just monetary cost, but opportunity cost. The cost of in-person voting increases when a potential voter's polling location is not located in the same building that it is normally located in, when a potential voter must spend more time traveling to the polling location, and when a potential voter must spend more time waiting in line at their polling location before casting a ballot. Number two, increases in the cost of in-person voting will cause some potential voters to cast a mail ballot instead of an in-person ballot, while causing other potential voters to abstain instead of casting an in-person ballot. In other words, not participate at all. And number three, racial and ethnic minorities are more likely to be disenfranchised by increases in the cost of in-person voting, in part because they are generally less trusting of mail ballots. So we've heard tonight that there are problems with the bank center. Fine, let's make an alternative for the bank center and that's the Amherst High School. 
But this idea that we should just throw out all the other polling locations that work according to the Secretary of State makes absolutely no sense from both a voting rights perspective and a public health perspective. And as to the point of studying this after September, the reason to do that is because we are going to have one primary that where the schools, as I understand it, are closed. So all the concerns that the superintendent laid out tonight are not relevant to the primary since those schools are closed and the schools are available. And it gives the council more time to figure out other alternative locations that are close to people's home that don't require travel. But consolidating all to one location is not a solution from a voting rights perspective. The last thing I'll say is that it is completely incredible to me that four days after the nation marked John Lewis's life, who dedicated his life to the right to vote, who gave blood for the right to vote, that four days later, this town council would vote to make it harder for people to vote. I cannot understand that. And I urge you both to vote down this proposal and to vote for Councillor Schoen's alternative proposal that will ensure that we can study this further after September 1, but not close all polling locations and leave it to only Amherst High School. Thank you. Sue Lowry, you're next. Uh, I just would like to point out that a quarter to a third of a mile might not seem like a long distance uh, for able-bodied people, but moving all of the voting to the high school will absolutely disenfranchise disabled people who do not have their own vehicle. And a quarter of a mile is an enormous distance uh, for people that have cardiac disease, pulmonary disease, orthopedic issues, neurologic problems. And it is unconscionable to me that we would have all of the town's voting be taking place uh, so far from the public transit system. Um, so I'd like to point that out. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Sue. We have somebody who is at a phone number and I need to identify yourself and where you live. Yes, hello? Yes. Um, okay, thank you, you can hear me. Um, yes. My name is Julian Hines. I live in District 4, and uh, I am gonna comment on voting um, rights and my concerns around um, voter disenfranchisement by moving the polling location to the high school. My first point is that the ideology that um, that it will help the public health situation um, to move 8,000 voters um, coming in um, in a 12-hour period to the high school is absolutely incorrect. There would be, um, there would be upwards of 8,000 people coming within a 12 hour period, probably most of them having to wait in a very long line that possibly would not be socially distanced. So I do not believe that that is the right goal from a public health perspective when you can have fewer amounts of people spread out across, um, across our 10 precincts and not have that issue. My second um, issue is on the heels of the decision to not cut the Amherst police budget by 82%, this would be a double blow to people of color and low income residents of this town um, who have been traditionally underrepresented by counselors um, and their government officials. So I do not expect and would not like to see a third or second, excuse me, decision um, that does that. My third issue is that for people with disabilities, people, low-income people who often have to work two or three jobs to get by, they do not have two hours to go through the public transit system, then walk three quarters of a mile, and then after that, wait in line for two hours, risking getting COVID-19 to vote. That is the exact, um, that is 
the exact definition of voter disenfranchisement. Um, we have seen in many other states um, polling locations be reduced. For example, in Georgia, this has lowered, not raised, voter turnout. So I understand the, the, the town clerk, town officials, and town council members do not have the intention to disenfranchise voters. However, I would like to make sure that you are aware that that is the un unintended, unintended consequence of what you are doing. And um, you need to be very careful that it isn't disproportionately affecting residents of um, low-income backgrounds and residents with disabilities and people of color. So um, my last point, to sum it all up, is I believe that even though there might be one or two um, locations that are not available, we can move those to an alternative location like the high school or somewhere else that we think of, and that only changes for 40% of voters rather than 100% of voters. So do you want 40% of voters to be confused and a small margin of those not to vote, or do you want 100% of voters to be confused and then not vote? I think it's pretty obvious that 40% is the better option. So I'm going to wrap it up because I believe I'm going over two minutes here pretty soon. Um, but I strongly urge you to keep as many voting locations the same as, as possible by what state law allows. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I, I would like to ask people to stick to the two minutes if at all possible. Zoe Crabtree, please state your name and where you live. Zoe, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Lovely. Yes. I had to uh, log into my computer again for some reason. Um, I just want to say, first of all, I can, I really 100% appreciate all of the hard work that has gone into this proposal. I hear that um, Shavina has been talking to a lot of people, a lot of officials, and really trying to make the best decision for our town. Um, but I agree with uh, all of the residents that I've been hearing on this call. Um, I think it, it is a, an appealing idea from a marketing perspective to say like, okay, we're changing it and all, you know, the only message is everyone goes to the high school. Um, then I work in marketing, that's a much easier message to share. Um, at least it's, it's easy to, to, to frame it as an easy message to share. But I, I also find that what some other folks are saying um, to be really compelling, which is that like, it doesn't matter if you know where your, your polling place is supposed to be if you now can't get there. Um, so one of the things that I uh, noticed as a student, um, but even more as um, a, a resident of this town for the last um, three or four years, um, the, the bus system is sorely lacking. And if you could, even if you can get where you wanna get, which maybe you know, all of the buses go through and stop near the high school, even if you can technically get there, um, it's gonna take a while. And, and yeah, people don't have a lot of time in the middle of, of their work day uh, to get off work or to show up late for work or to leave work early um, to take care of uh, voting and their family responsibilities and their work responsibilities. So um, getting there is gonna be a really big challenge even if you know that's where you're supposed to go. Um, and I also wanna point out that um, we spoke earlier about how um, the percentage of vote by mail ballots that we received back was very high in the recent um, primary, I think this past March. Um, but we're in a different world now where a bunch of people are being encouraged to sign up for vote, vote by mail um, ballots that haven't necessarily done it before um, because of the pandemic. And so and we said we like 380 or something for this past election, 4,000 people have, have submitted um, applications so far. That's a, a much higher number. Um, obviously, vote by mail is great, um, but we can't expect to have the same return rate on those ballots as we did previously because um, we don't know if people um, are, are just doing it because they are feeling compelled because of the pandemic, but they don't actually know how to follow through or intend to follow through. Um, I just don't think that we can count on that conversion rate to be the same. So please, uh, I, I really 
think that uh, Kathy Shane and, and Dorothy's, not Dorothy, um, Darcy's comments earlier about trying to keep as many polling places the same as possible um, would, would be really best in the situation. Thank you. Um, thank you for your comment. Jocelyn Ford, please. Please unmute and state your name and where you live. Hi, this is really Barbara Ford. And okay. are you hearing me? I hope. Yes, we can, oh, Barbara. Okay. I live in uh, District 2, and I am a warden in one of the precincts, was. And I've had many people come to our precinct who don't know where they should vote. And um, I'm thinking, I originally thought that having this in a central place is a good idea because most people should know where the high school is. If they don't, I think we can publish an old fashioned map early on and put it every place. And um, my other idea is this is all going to be key to help transportation help because people normally get to their polls by car or not or walk, as you say. And I think if we had a transportation at every old precinct that would take people directly to the high school and back eventually might be a good answer to this. And it's possible that other folks who work in all of that in odd places could find their way to one of the precincts where they could get a bus or something to go there. So that's my, my thought on the matter. And that's it for now. Thank you, Barbara. Um, Adrian Tarazi. Please unmute. There you go. Yes, hello. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, my name is Adrian Terizzi, and although I'm a resident of District 5, I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Amherst. We have sent you a rather long statement, but I will be very short tonight. Our main point was to ask for a postponement to a near date on a vote on this consolidation report. We feel that given all of all of the issues you've heard tonight uh, that address the fact that details of this plan have not been communicated either in the proposal, such as the health risks, the potential impact on the communities around our neighborhoods, the impact, the adverse impact on voter access based on race, national origin, disability, income, or age of Amherst voters. It's yet to be known in the details of this proposal. And our thinking is that if you postpone and delay for a near date, that the proposal can be better fleshed out to give residents the opportunity to both understand as well as to provide additional public input, which you have allowed for tonight. But residents of Amherst are typically accustomed to having a great deal of public input and at least some more time to consider the effects of this, of this change. So we understand uh, that Amherst-like communities across the nation, we face substantial challenges in preparing for the upcoming election in the midst of this pandemic. And we're aware of the outbreaks in Massachusetts and the, the thought that's gone behind this proposal you're presenting tonight. Please consider delaying and postponing this vote until the issue is further worked out among you, a conversation I've much enjoyed listening to tonight and that solutions and citizen input can be better fleshed out. Thank you for your time. I'm so appreciative of it. Thank you, Adrian. Um, we have a few more comments and then we do need to move on, please. Uh, John Page, please. Can you hear me? Yes. This is John Page, 683 East Pleasant Street, speaking as a resident. Um, we've heard a lot of critiques with the plan for polling places. So I just wanted to raise some of the strategies we discussed uh, in the what we call the post-election stakeholders roundtable 
immediately after the 2018 election um, with Margaret. Um, Athena was there, George as well. Um, one of the things we discussed was infrastructure on campus and off for national elections. We worked with MassPerg and other advocacy orgs on campus for absentee voting and early voting. Um, and I know that work is happening now with the expansion of mail-in votes. Um, but we also worked with UMass Democrats and other volunteers to commit to ride sharing to the polls and even having a number you could call for a vote mobile to transport you there. So, but one of the most important decisions that we came to in that round table um, was that with campus officials committing to this was the establishing polling places on campus for national elections as the default every two years, um, because we struggle to build that infrastructure from scratch each time. Um, so hopefully that'll become part of no normal operating procedure. I, I do realize that during these extraordinary circumstances, there aren't as many good options. Um, I'm a practical person, so I understand that the 2020 primary in general will not be a model for elections going forward, but I still want to raise these ideas that we discussed back then, a couple of years ago now. Um, so they're part of the conversation, and I would be happily, happy to help with organizing any of those initiatives, um, as well as I'm sure the league, as Adrian just spoke about. Thank you very much. Jose, can you come back in and make sure we can hear you? Thank Ahora you. Sí, you are yes. Andale, pues. Buenas noches a todos ustedes. Uh, pues quería solamente hablar un poco de um, este tema de, de información, pasándolo de, los, um, de la gente de la comunidad, a ver cómo van a votar, cómo van a llegar ahí a su lugar y si no uh, entienden el idioma de inglés. Now, did you all catch that? How many of y'all caught that? Sorry. It's kind of confusing, did. right? You don't Ex understand because you only speak English. Right. You don't speak English. Well, it, you know, the, the, the point that I'm trying to really make here is now we're, we're talking about having confusion limited. Now we're going to be making changes. We're going to be making changes in another language. Are we? I don't know if we are. We don't have an interpreter here. A large percentage of the voice of the Amherst voters is not being heard. We're not being served. And so I'll just leave that one there for, for you to consider. And I'd like to go back to the, um, I went back and I did a, a, a little quick review of the uh, Amherst Regional High School Accessibility Report that was released in February of uh, 2019. And I don't know if any of this is done, that's why I was kind of disappointed that uh, Mike Morris had left uh, the meeting, but there were some issues in there that the, the site parking and interest issues, the main lot lacks van accessible space and lacks signage at the head of some of the designated, I guess, accessible parking spaces. The parking configuration is not compliant in some of the areas. Passenger loading zone is not striped and lacks signage. Uh, we're talking about walkways have excessive cross and running slopes and abrupt changes in level. Uh, those, are, those are real challenges to people with disabilities. And then, of course, we also have the disability of people who are immune, autoimmune compromised. And we're trying to put them all into one big space. No matter how we, we, we decide here as a, as a community to, to line everybody up, to put everybody in a safe space, we're putting a percentage of our population at risk. And we're going to be confusing them if we don't have the appropriate language. We're going to be giving them a disadvantage and we're going to sit there and silence that majority of the, that part of our of our community's voice and so i wanted to share that with you uh, just as to continue with uh, everyone else's comments about how it is better to serve our community and it would be if we have to change one location rather than change many and just forget uh, that there's a lot of other people that might be uh, involved in this okay thank you for your time thank you for your comment jose uh, Jonathan Seville. Hi, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Good. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you all for your time and your hard work. Um, I, I understand the difficulty uh, that the task really asks of you to resolve public health guidance and state guidance. Uh, and I want to thank especially the clerk for their really hard and thoughtful work on this issue. And I can hear in, in everyone speaking, uh, for the most part, um, your best intentions. Um, but I want to second and emphasize the concerns we've heard here tonight and, and 
and give you a little framing um, from my field. So as a special educator, we talk about the difference between intent and impact. Um, and sometimes, even with the best of intentions, the decisions we make that affect other people uh, can have an impact on them that's negative. Um, this is something I try to teach my students and my own children at home. Um, because <clears throat> the positive intent put forward doesn't negate the negative impact that comes after, right? Uh, there's a really great podcast that just started coming out called Nice White Parents. And it discusses in a, a school system in New York, uh, the way a group of really well-intentioned, um, but also well-resourced and very privileged white parents interacted with this community. Um, and, and I think it, it describes really well this relationship between intent and impact. Um, I think you should use as your barometer for the impact, the voices of the community that you are hearing I've discussed, uh, I've heard discussed several times the, the huge number of responses that counselors got and the very clear message they got from the community. Um, and I would like to shine a little light uh, critically on, on this sort of framing around, well, um, it's hard to be a leader and sometimes we just have to trust the experts. I think we've heard from experts here tonight, uh, experts on voting rights, experts on disability, experts on their own life. Um, and they are telling you um, this will harm me and the people that I care for. Um, <clears throat> so I encourage you to put your vote to the 10th. Vote no for this proposal this evening. Thank you. I don't want to take any more than is my time. Thank you for your comments, Jonathan. Lydia Irons. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you can. So... I just want to um, give you all a second to take a deep breath and think about all of the things that you've heard tonight. You've heard from experts, you've heard from your community, and I am getting this very strange sense of deja vu of other town council meetings that I've been a part of where you have heard over and over and over again what your community was asking of you. And you know what? You disappointed us heavily and wholeheartedly, and you broke people's hearts. So just sit with that for one second. I'll take a deep breath of my two minutes so that you can sit in that discomfort and knowing how disappointed your community was in you. So I wanna use the rest of my time to take you on a little journey because I'm not just someone who's been a part of these meetings, but I'm also someone who has two small children and does use public transportation. So I have two small children, one of whom is too small to wear a mask. The other one will wear their mask, but it is hard for them and it is difficult and hot and it is hard for me to keep that mask on that child. So I walk to my nearest bus, which is about a mile away. I get on that bus and then I'm in a bus that is a small and enclosed place with my two children and myself. And I'm on that bus for about 15 minutes before I get to the high school. And then I have to take those children off that bus and walk to the high school and again, be in a small enclosed place. So I just want you to think about the people who have small children and do not have access to all of the amenities that you all might have access to and that other people in Amherst have access to because this is an accessibility issue. Shutting down polling places will mean that mothers like myself cannot vote. And someone here on this call said that I've never had a problem voting by mail. Well, then you've obviously never had issues keeping track of things in your house. You've also never had things be lost in your house. You've never had more than one person collecting your mail. And I just feel like that is not listening to what people are saying. Vote by mail is an option for some, but it is not an option for all, especially those who live in apartment complexes where the mail is sorted and things get lost. So please do not shut down my polling place because I won't be able to vote and that will be on all of you. Thank you for your comment. We're going back to the town council and uh, we 
I think we need to get a sense from the council as to whether or not you want to continue the discussion tonight and bring it to conclusion or go uh, bring it uh, further on discussion on the 10th. But I do need to check with Paul and the town clerk as to what is required by when in order for us to set some dates certain. Shavina, are you still yes. here? I'm still here. <laughs> so um, the deadline we have to make a decision is 20 days before an election uh, to move a polling location. So let me take a peek where that brings us. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the decision, the the decision to move a polling location, you have to vote. The council would have to vote on it 20 days prior to an election. And 20 calendar days. Correct. Correct. That brings us to tonight. Okay. And if the first election is on September 1st and we voted on tonight, we meet that requirement. If we delay till the 10th, we do we still meet the requirement. I am checking to I'm checking the the expanded uh, legislation to see if the deadline changed. Let me grab Check that. Early voting. Not early voting. Sorry to hold people up, but I think it's important that we understand what our deadlines are. Lynn, I had down early voting August 22nd. I wrote that in my date book. Early voting is done at a single location. And um, so I guess the question you're asking is whether or not we have established that location. I, th I believe we have. You're pausing because Shavin is checking the um, recently. My, uh, yes, go ahead, Shavin. Sorry, my apologies. My apologies for the delay. I have I have so many um, <laughs> I have so many of the MGLs printed, so I wanted to let me just double check the deadline to see if it moved.
it does not appear that there has been a change in the 20 day deadline. Okay. And uh, does that also include the question of early voting? No, because we are discussing changing uh, our, our regular perm, uh, polling location, early voting. Um, we, uh, we decide uh, whatever location is ideal for early voting because that's just uh, at a certain time. It's not a permanent uh, location. As okay. In our regular polling locations are. Okay, and am I correct that early voting at this point is scheduled to take place in the lobby at the Bang Center? That is correct. Okay. So um, I'm looking at hands and I, uh, Dorothy. Okay, I have a couple of points that are have not been yet made. And I'm talking about COVID-19 and Dr. Deborah Burks saying that we are now entering a new phase and being a little vague, but kind of scary about it and talking about the reemergence of hotspots. So therefore, every time I hear about ride sharing, I say, gee, I'm not allowed to even have my grandchildren in my car um, or to go into their house. Um, I would not offer the, a ride to somebody else uh, in case I were positive or they were positive. So the old ways of ride sharing, I don't think that's gonna work. I also share uh, Lydia's worry about the bus. Um, I raised my kids without a car for the first um, 12 years, and I know what it's like to be taking them with you everywhere you go. But on a bus now with COVID-19, I wouldn't do that. Um, I think um, the other area of COVID-19 that I'm very concerned about is the workers at the polling places, particularly at the high school. The, the, we, we keep learning more about this terrible disease, but one thing seems to come clear, that it's the intensity and the length of the exposure, which seems to determine the severity of the illness. And uh, the polling workers, our poll workers, or the wardens are gonna be in that high school for a long time with lots of people coming and going. I, I just see it as, as what they like to call a Petri dish. Um, I mean, I was for the idea for, for the reasons that you, you, it, the program was put together when it was first presented. It made sense to me. But upon further reflection, it does not make sense to me. Um, and I think that wherever it is, if there's any kind of concentration of people, the shifts must be shorter for the poll workers, even if they're young poll workers, because young people are now getting it. So the only positive thing that I come up with from our discussion is keep the polling places that work, add new ones uh, as makes sense, um, and really increase early voting. Um, and if early voting can be done without having to have the specific precincts, then you can make a couple of early voting places, north, center, and south of Amherst. And I think a lot of people will be very happy to vote in those circumstances. And we can avoid crowds, lines, indoor air. I just think of the air in that high school near the end of the day, it would just have so many germs in it. It would be rather terrifying. So I, I hope we can work something out. And I think if we could work something out sooner rather than later, it would be better. Andy, you have your hand up. Yes, I appreciate all of the comments from all the people we heard from today. I end up with two things that I think about a lot though. One is that, uh, we've talked about the importance of people being able to know where to go to vote, that that knowledge um, and consistency and therefore consistency is important. And so it would seem that what we establish for the primary election to have consistency carrying over to the general election when we have um, predictions of even greater turnout um, seems to be particularly important, which then gets back to, I'm, dis I'm sorry that we, I couldn't ask questions of Dr. Morris when he was with us. Um, but the question for me is not just what can be done in September for the primary in elementary schools, and I'm um, not just being Crocker Farm because I think he spoke, he spoke very clearly and strongly about Crocker Farm and why it's not um, an acceptable location for um, their purposes. But um, 
to hear a little bit more about what the plans are for the other two elementary schools when it comes to the November election. Because if they have um, educational uses planned for the gymnasium, um, then to think that we can um, plan with certainty to have elections in um, those gymnasiums come November, um, I, I'm just not certain. And that's why it would have been helpful to be able to have that discussion with them beforehand. Um, if they are trying to uh, move classrooms into those spaces, it will be very difficult to do that. Um, and uh, the question also is the number of days they have to close schools. Because in the end, the, we build school buildings for a purpose. And the purpose is not to vote, the purpose is to educate our children. And that's the highest and most important use of those buildings. Uh, so that sort of gets me then to the final point that I just wanted to make, which was uh, sort of my reaction to what Kathy has proposed earlier. And um, I, if we end up reducing the number of uh, polling places, but trying to maintain polling places um, in multiple locations to the extent possible, and if that's where the council as, a group, as we as a group decide to go, I would encourage us to still look for the fact, for the question of consistency um, between the two elections and making sure that elementary schools are used for the purposes that we have elementary schools. And uh, the um, benefit of um, having some people voting at the high school uh, but it would be at least it provides some test to that. So I think with that, I will leave it and let, it, let another member of the council comment. Yeah. Alyssa. I just want to make sure we emphasize that if you don't want to ride the bus to the high school, you can still ride the bus or walk if it works for you to early voting in downtown Amherst, which at this point we believe is going to be at Bangs. And I just want to clarify that there are a lot of things we don't know, and there are some things we do know. I know that the town council doesn't get to decide where early voting is. So why people are making up ideas as to how they're going to decide where that is, is not helpful. I know that it's not legal in Massachusetts to decide to vote at whatever precinct you want to vote at. So when you combine those kind of, wouldn't these be cool ideas, with your rationale for why this is such a bad idea, it's really hard for me to sort the wheat from the chaff there. Um, town council doesn't decide where early voting is. The town clerk decides that. Town council is providing that early voting is available. Vote by mail is available. I understand that vote by mail is a new thing for us, but to say that it's going to work exactly the same place it worked other places, I'm not comfortable with. My final concern is that I think we should make the decision tonight, whatever it is, and move on with educating people. I don't believe we're going to gain additional information between now and next week, and we're just going to lose a week in publicizing whatever the plan is. I'd like to start publicizing the plan now. And did you? I agree with Alyssa that we need to decide tonight. One week delay is one more week we don't have to educate residents on where they need to vote. And we know at least some people are moving. Um, so, you know, I, I read Kathy's motion. It doesn't even declare where two of those precincts would be um, voting. Um, we need to decide that. So we'd have to figure that out tonight. Um, and I'm not saying that that's not possible. Um, I am seriously concerned that the school committee will tell Dr. Morris not to allow voting at Crocker Farm, Fort River, and Wildwood, especially for November, but if not also for September, because while the students might not be in the building in September, on September 1, the educators will be. And if they're putting classrooms in those buildings, they're gonna be moving those classrooms in and they're gonna have to figure out how to educate in those 
locations in those buildings. And I am seriously concerned that we're not even going to have any of the schools available, um, if not in September, not in November. Uh, because we can't tell the superintendent, we can't, even if we want them there, we can't say, open up your building. Um, you know, and so I, Munson is really tiny. Um, I'm not sure I've heard from our town clerk that that is actually a viable location with social distancing. Um, you know, I have voted there for now a year and when you take out and make the six foot distances, the where, where the line is, everyone's waiting outside anyway because of how that line works. Um, if you even get five voting booths in there, um, you know, it sounds like North Amherst Fire Station wouldn't even be open. We're not looking at potentially just three locations changing. We're looking at potentially six of the eight changing if we don't have either of any of the schools um, or Bang Center for two of the three, I guess it would be five of the eight, but not seven of the 10 precincts changing. We're between a rock and a hard place. This is not an easy decision, but, um, you know, I think the ease of saying everyone is at the high school and the space the high school allows will give some measure of knowledge and certainty to all of our residents. And this is not where I was 12 hours ago or eight hours ago, um, but I think it's the best we can offer right now with 27 days until people vote at these locations. Um, I, I think, you know, just like the school committee doesn't have anything, any good options for schooling this year. We got no good options here. Um, and I think we need to pick the best of what's presented. And I think that's at this point, the high school for everyone. Sarah. So I can see the, the fact that it would be hard to try to find other polling places um, and that you know, although Paul, the town manager said in the beginning, if we wanted to try to keep as many as we could, we can find a way. Um, I think we have to find a way to have as many polling places open as we can. And I will, I'm going to tell you from the things that I heard from people in my precinct, and I'm going to tell you from my own experience, two kids with autism, uh, you could try to take kids into a restaurant with autism and I'll tell you how people are going to react with that. Um, not well, people, it's, it's hard. I raised my kids. I mean, I walked everywhere and my kids were attached to me because I didn't have someone to watch them. That's not unusual. Um, and autoimmune disease runs in my family. I, my mom had lupus and a heart transplant. If I had to try to get my kids and my mom my mom could not get into a restaurant if she, even with a walker, if she had to walk a quarter of a mile. I think the things that people are bringing up are very, very real. And maybe they're not real to all of us, or it seems like it's simplistic, but it is real. And I, I think that we have to work a little bit harder and, and try to keep, I mean, even if you say to me, you know, well, maybe only four could be open, Four is better than one, and I think we need to try. I'm ready to vote tonight, and I think we need to try to keep as many places the same and open. That's it. Melanie? Yeah, we've heard from so many residents, and we've heard from experts. We've heard from doctors today, and it seems like even if we have to work extra hard to make this happen, we need to do it. And one thing I would say is that I would go for the consistency between the primaries and general elections because, yeah, I mean, and I, I do agree we should have the report still to figure out what were the gaps that we can address them and do a better job of but uh, making sure that we reach more people or whatever the problems were. So we should do a report after the primaries, but 
but we should still stick with the same and just the marketing cost and getting the message out is going to be really hard if it's two different places. But I am totally for, after hearing so many people and their challenges with people with disabilities and, and so forth. So anyway, I think if we need to stay all night and figure this out, game on. Kathy. When I when I wrote uh, the motion, um, Lynn emailed me later that there wasn't a possibility that the high school could be an option for everybody, that we have to have specific places move to the high school. So Mandy's correct. I didn't name which Bangs Center of the three would move. So I'm looking at the map and it looks like five and 10 are closer to the high school and four is closer to Bangs. So if I had to pick one to still go to Bangs, you know, I do it based on that because I'm focused on making you a, a possible to walk to your polling site and keep your own. If we literally can't use the fire station, so I'm going through, is it the fire station, two at Bangs, go to the high school, the fire station, and if Crocker, as of November cannot be used, then Crocker, I heard Mike, and we could verify him, say that he can make the gyms work at Wildwood and Fort River. It'll take some working and decontamination, but he could. He didn't say absolutely not. So I think I'm counting two precincts from Bang moved to the high school, the, the fire station moves to the high school and Crocker moves to the high school. And I originally wrote it that we'd make that decision for September and revisit. I can understand the argument that we want to keep it the same for November, but learn what happened because we need to, we're not going to need to have a lot of information for that point, um, including um, did the mail work? Did people vote by mail? Because you know we're gonna we're gonna know what kind of crowds we got, where um, or didn't get crowds, um, and so so I'm I so I'm amending my motion to say with these exceptions and and name the two from Bangs that would move Fire and Crocker, um, but I'm sticking with not one. No, so that that I will be voting against the consolidating everything to one. So I don't know how to, um, if it, people want to move to, that's, I think, emerging as the other option. And Andy said he'd love a better answer on the two other schools. Um, but what I heard about the Zion Church and the Lutheran Church is those are feasible. We have to rent them and we're going to have to decontaminate them, but they are there. Um, um, and they're a close walk up up here, the Zion Church, there's Riverside Apartments, there's Mill Hollow Apartments, people can walk. And then the last thing, I didn't make enough of the UMass decision. Uh, as I understand it, UMass doesn't want us to come on campus. I'm wondering whether Paul, with all your eloquence on getting the chancellor to listen, couldn't say, suppose UMass staffs an early polling place at UMass. What we heard is stu students will go local if, if they don't know, and that can we get them to staff it and police it? The, they have an entrance and an exit, a perfect place to do early voting. I voted early last year, last time that was available because it was so easy. So I think UMass is a real issue. We can't go on campus and we don't want them coming off campus. So we've got to, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> Does that mean, you know, and they're not going to be back in time to register for, for September. Um, they may be back in time for, for mail. They'll be back in time to register mail for November. So maybe we can get everyone. So I just urge that we don't give up on a possible UMass and one, a letter of, can the chancellor ra rise to the civic duty of making voting possible on campus? If we can't make it happen, could the higher ups at UMass? So I'm just saying that as a side, because I had several people call me about um, UMass um, and not, not leaving them out. So I'm amending my thing where I just said the two places from Bangs would move because it sounded like we have a, I'm not totally sure on the fire station, you couldn't decontaminate a cement floor if we are in a bay, but if we just can't, then then move that one. So that, I, 
trying to provide an alternative to keep as many as possible. Kathy, I, in order for us to actually have the motion, um, I'm trying to figure out how we can. I can I can type it into mine and show it on a screen. I mean, I just, you know, I, I guess, Lynn, do you want to, there are, it seems like there's many voices asking for more than one. There are some happy with one. And I, I, I would like to make a motion. I think the issue is getting the motion clear and make sure that it is consistent with the kind of motion that was put forward. Um, and we have two different motions. One is the um, the locations and the other one is the actual warrant. Um, and um, part of me wants to say, we're gonna pause for this, come back and vote before the evening's out. Uh, and uh, see whether or not we have, um, we can, we can also try the vote that's already on the, that's already on the motion sheet. And if it fails, then we come back with another one. So, um, I'm, uh, let's, let's go with the vote that's on the motion sheet. And if it fails, before the end of the evening, we'll come back with another vote. Okay. So George, are you willing yes, to- I am ready to put into motion the, the motion that is on the motion sheet, which is to locate in-person voting on September 1, 2020 and November 3, 2020 for all 10 voting precincts at Amherst Pelham Regional High School, 21 Mattoon Street, as this will have no disparate adverse impact on access to the polls on the basis of race, national origin, disability, income, or age. Is there a second? Mandy seconds. Okay. Can I, I just, can I make just one comment on that? The positive statement that, that this will have no disparate impact. We can't make that statement. We're hoping, but we can't say that. You know, even if you want to vote for consolidating, we can't say it will have no disparate. It's, we can't. I believe, I believe the law requires us to say this. I believe that it's required of us to say this because what? if we can't say it, then we can't do it. Well, so we can't. Right. We cannot say that. The evidence is that it could likely have a disparate impact. So I looked at that, that it will not is such a, we know for sure it will not. Um, anyway, I just want to point that out to those of you who want to vote for this motion. So well, it's I'm, not there because I have absolute certainty. It's there because the law requires us to put it there. Does the motion include the word, this change shall be permanent as the, as the written thing came to no, us? No, it does not. Motion. I did not say that. Did I say that? That's I what I'm asking you. I'm asking you if it said well, it. Well, you're listening. I read the motion. Okay. So I it changed again, this if you like. Okay, that's good. It changed. It does not include that the, it would be permanent. It only is for select the election on September 1st. September 1 and, and November 3. Okay. Uh, we begin with any further discussion. Alyssa? We also can't say that retaining the current polling places does not have a disparate effect. We already know that we have pockets of town that don't vote now at our current polling places for many of the same reasons. So it would not be factual to say that leaving it the way it is does not have that impact. And since there is no such thing as leaving it the way it is, literally, even if we change one thing, we have to give a report that says it does not have a disparate impact. And so even if you only change one polling place, you're going to have to say that. And of course, none of it's factual. So it's just the best we can come up with. As George said, it's the law. I also want to create two previous misstatements of fact. Students are in fact t back in time for voter registration for the primary. As is clearly stated on the town website, the primary, the voter registration for the primary is August 22nd. Classes start the 24th. Obviously, they're back in time. We've been talking about them coming for weeks. The other point is you can talk 
a really nice game about how UMass should be wanting to provide this, what I would say is that UMass should be wanting their students to vote. UMass should not be wanting to provide this because UMass can't bar me from showing up on campus to vote. I didn't sign the agreement about COVID. They can't make it a private polling place only for people who signed the agreement. That's illegal. So please stop offering up things that are not legal to do in, in order to comply with your intentions. I will be voting in favor of the motion as stated. Uh, Kathy Shane, you have your hand up. Uh, I'll take, I'm taking it down. Okay, Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. Yep. I just want to also mention whether this, if this fails and Kathy's motion goes on the table, Kathy's motion must also include the phrase as this will now have no disparate adverse impact on access to the polls on the basis of race, national origin, disability, income, or age, because any time we vote to change polling locations, we must make that determination. So Kathy's motion is, is a motion, her intended motion, if this one fails, is a motion to change the polling location of four polling lo places, four polling precincts, and we would have to make a determination for that one too, that it will have no disparate adverse impact on access to the polls on the basis of race, national origin, disability, income, or age. And one of those that she just proposed was Crocker Farm up to the high school, which we've heard from many people in South Amherst would have some sort of disparate impact. If it has it for our, for this motion here, then it has it for Kathy's motion too. Um, so we can't have it both ways is my point. Uh, moving to the high school either has a disparate impact on those four locations that Kathy proposed or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, it doesn't have it for this motion and it doesn't have it for what Kathy would like to propose. But if it does have it for this one, it also has it for the one Kathy wants to propose. As I said, we're in a rock and a hard place, between a rock and a hard place, but I'm gonna vote for this one because I think it is the least bad option. Andy. Yeah, I'm still stuck on the question about the elementary school. And um, I wanna come back to the email that you sent to the council earlier today, which I believe I can now reference to. Um, and I maybe, Paul or Shavina need to respond to this, but one of the bullets that you included was, the school committee has asked us not to use the elementary schools because of cross-contamination. That includes three additional sites. Uh, and that is, of course, in precluding three additional sites. They have uh, to close the school for the election and then for a few days after the election to decontaminate. And their plans are, uh, reopening, including use of gyms for classrooms, which is where the polls are located. Um, if that is information and is pertainable to the November election, I think that we need to know the answer to that because that's critical to a lot of our thinking about what is possible. And uh, if uh, and if we're going to vote tonight, we need to do the best we can with available information to us. Uh, it knocks out three locations that are very important locations, but uh, it is the reality. Okay, me, uh, Paul, you have your hand up. Yes, yeah, thank you. So I did ask Mike that question. Are you using gyms for classrooms? He says, not for core classrooms, but yes, for special ed. Um, and so, that was his answer to that question, Andy. Does that answer all your question, Andy? Well, I mean, it's hard to tell because I don't know with special education uh, whether it's something that gets set up and is for continuous use or whether it yep. gets taken down. I just don't have an answer to that. Well, so frankly, I don't think they really know, Andy, because they haven't voted on a plan and I think everything's in flux. So we're just making the best decision we can. Um, and that they'll be voting tomorrow night. I understand. And, and the statement that I made was based on the best information we have at the moment. 
it is totally in flux. Dorothy? Okay. Um, this is a question I, that perhaps Paul and Shavina can answer. Is it not possible to use some private places? I mean, for example, a bank or Amherst Works, a former bank. I could see Amherst Works being a very fine polling place, centrally located. So a polling location has to be a public location and it has to have the accessibility. And the private location, if that's what you're referring to, would have to say yes to allow us to use mm -hmm. your location. And so we're just at a shortage of locations in town. It might be a good place. I'm, I'm trying to remember the entrance, whether it's accessible or not. Oh, there's this, Bob said there's a side entrance to Amherst Works. Oh yes, okay. It might be a very good place. Right. Thank you. Um, Shalini. Uh, I had a question for Paul or whoever. Can we, uh, with respect to schools, I heard that one of the issues is in cleaning the place for and making it ready for students. And if we could get pay over, you know, get staff to do that, I mean, should be doable, but I don't know what the ch challenges are in that. And the comment, and I wanted to make a comment about, um, you know, if you had to, uh, about will it have a disparate adverse impact on access to the polls between the two uh, options here based on what we're hearing. I mean, obviously we don't know I, in either case, but if I had to choose one where I feel more confidence, it would be with the option of giving more polling uh, options based on all the people we've heard and experts and doctors and people with disabilities and kids and so forth. And they all are favoring that they will come and vote if there are multiple and closer polling locations. So I would feel more comfortable making that statement that this will uh, have no disparate adverse effect if we go with more polling options than one. Darcy, uh, Paul, you had your hand up. Yeah, just, just to answer that question, it, we will, whatever is required in, in terms of industrial cleaning, the town would take care of that. We'd be responsible for that. Well, would COVID money pay for that? We could use COVID money to do that, yes. Okay. Thank you. That's useful to know. But it does, but Paul, but um, Dr. Morris did say that um, in Crocker Farm, they would have to close for a couple days afterwards to completely clean the school because you had to go through the school to get to the polling place. Yeah. I think the yeah. November November election is a bigger challenge for them than the September election because students don't come back until mid September under the current plan that they're looking at now. But staff are back on August thirty first. And the same thing is true for Fort River and mm -hmm. Wildwood, but in those cases, only the gyms would be used and they're accessible from the outside, so only the gym would have to go through the deep cleaning. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. Steve Schreiber. Yeah, so this is Amherst, and we're going to get conflicting information about everything. So, for example, the discussion about accessibility, that exact same discussion can be made for you know, whether or not the high school is accessible. That exact same analysis can put pretty much every polling place out of business if we really took that kind of you know, analysis on the, the slopes and the location of typical handicap parking. So I'm, I'm still, there's a huge body of voters in Amherst that we actually have not heard from, but we've certainly talked about, and that are the students. So I've lost track of how many precincts are actually crisscross the actual UMass campus, but it's a substantial number. I know that um, four of the five districts cover part of the UMass property. So that's where the voter confusion is, which is something that I talked about earlier. One of the speakers, Barbara Ford, mentioned the confused voters that come when she's working, I think she said when she's working at the polls. So on this, that's the group that I'm concerned about, are not the, the, the voters the, who are really paying attention, which are us and the uh, lots of people that are speaking to us, 
but the people that are new to town or people that aren't engaged in this process. So those are the ones that are operating sort of outside of this knowledge base and they're the ones that will become the most disenfranchised because if we consult, I'm totally convinced that if we consolidate all of the precincts into one building, we will be helping that group of, of voters who are would otherwise be confused. So I'm voting yes. Sarah, you have your hand up. So it seems to me that people in town generally figure out which precinct that they go to. And if they want to ask someone, they usually ask a neighbor. They usually ask someone who's in their precinct. This is where people know where to get to. This is where people can walk to. I cannot stress to you enough that there are a majority of people that are disabled or have autoimmune or have little kids or don't for real don't have a car and it, the 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 thought of seriously do you would you want to bring your young kids or would you want to have an autoimmune disease and be on a bus for however long i think that we keep open as many places as we can as far as the schools go how many days did we lose last year to covid if the worst case scenario is that we lose two or three days while things are deep cleaned, then we lose two or three days of school to deep cleaning. I, I think that confusion is going to be a lot greater for real if you have 100% of the people now not knowing where to go and also people cannot get there. I can't stress that enough. You have local polling places so that people can walk and can get there. That's the importance of it. That's why we've always had it. That's why, and this is, this is a huge election. We're not talking just about governors or town councilors. We're talking about the president of the United States. Um, Shalini. And adding to what Sarah just said, this is COVID and we prefer, I mean, the more people can walk, it's so much safer than having people go in buses, public transportation and all of that. So the more we can disperse crowds, the more we can allow people to reach places. It seems like that's more, I mean, even if I didn't hear from anyone, that just seems more logical. But the fact that we've heard from experts and doctors and all the people to me is like, we need to make this work somehow. That's how I feel. Okay. So the motion on the floor is to locate in-person voting on September 1, 2020 and November 3rd, 2020 for all 10 voting precincts at Amherst Region, Pelham Regional High School, 21 Mattoon Street, as this would will have no disparate adverse impact on access to the polls on the basis of race, national origin, disability, income, or age. It's been made and seconded. And we'll start with Mandy Jo. Yes. Dorothy Pam. No. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. No. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. No. Shalini Ball Milne. No. Alyssa Brewer. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. No. Darcy Dumont. No. And, and, and Lynn Griesmer. <laughs> I've been here before. Um, I'm actually going to vote no. I, I am feeling very, very torn by all of this. 
and I would like to see a something that allows us to keep as many of our polling places as possible and move the rest to the high school. I'm feeling very, very torn. Um, Lynn? Yeah. I have a, I guess it's a point of order or a question. Um, yeah. This might be for the town clerk. The town report that we had to file three days before voting to change a location had the location changes for the high school for all the precincts. Do we need to file a new report three days before we vote to change to any for any other changes? Yes. So that means we cannot vote tonight on any other option? Am I correct in that? Vina? Since we filed- I'm, I'm reading it, I'm rereading it now. Um, what was the vote, by the way? Uh, seven to six. Seven, seven. Seven, seven people voted against and six people voted for. So the new change would the new change would require a new report because the new report would be on the changes to the new location and that the new location wouldn't have a disparate effect on those groups. Right, Pat DeAngelis, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say it seems to me you know, since we can't vote on uh, a, a new amendment that it would be good for um, the town clerk Shavana to move ahead with investigating what she feels are the best options with the other places that we've talked about. And that would give us um, time to then vote on, or not, I mean, we have, we've, to, I'm, bleh, I'm not sure exactly how this works because we denied the motion to move everything to the high school, but, if, but we can't vote tonight to accept Kathy's, um, Propos motion or amended or anything, but if Shivana is working on it um, in the meantime, and then we set up the vote for when we need to have it, I think that would be very valuable. I will have to call the Secretary of State tomorrow to get direction because tomorrow, honestly, is the deadline for any polling location to be changed. Tomorrow is the 20 day deadline. So I will have to call Michelle Tassinari to get direction. Wait a minute, that's new information. Yeah, it's not 20 days from September 1st. It is 20 calendar days. Oh. Yeah. Well, that you, question was oh, raised in the beginning of the not, meeting. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Shavina, please tell us again what you just said. Yes, so in order to make a polling location change, it has to be voted on 20 days before an election. And when you asked me that earlier, I said we had to, you had to vote tonight on the change because the September 1st election brings us right to this week. Yep. It's not 20 days. It's not 20 days. So I'm just not understanding the math. She says 20 calendar days. Well, it brings us to tomorrow. Tomorrow is 20 calendar days. What? No, calendar. 20 business, 20 business days. Does she mean business days? No, 20 calendar days. Well, 20 calendar days from today is uh, the 20. Tomorrow. No, it's the 20. Is it 20 calendar days before the registration uh -huh. deadline? No, it's 20 calendar days before the election, and the election is <laughs> September 1st. But but if we did it on the 10th, that is 20 days before September 1st. On it is my not. 20 calendar days. Do not. I think you mean work days. days. I think you I mean think, work days. Uh, well, that's, I think what we're asking, is it a Monday through Friday or is it? Yes. But is that's there, not a calendar day. That's a business day. Business calendar day. day is a day on the calendar. Because I just read the thing and it did say calendar days. So I, I just have to find the, um, so there is, clearly a difference between is it Monday through Friday or 
Sunday through Saturday. It's Monday through Friday. Lynn? Yes. Can I make a motion to reconsider the last vote? Yes. I move to reconsider the last vote. Under rule, our council rules, 7.6 allow any counselor to make that motion. Second. I think. And who made the second? So, uh, seven point, sorry, 7.5B, motions from the non-prevailing side. Any counselor voting with the non-prevailing side may move for reconsideration when such motion is accompanied by submission of new additional information, which is that we only have till tomorrow to decide. And I second it. Steve, you seconded. Thank you. Is there any further conversation? Yes, I don't believe that a calendar day is the same as a business day. I don't believe it. So I'm trying to look it up on the on the uh, computer on my phone. Okay, because calendar day. It's MGL chapter. Um, Mandy, I excuse me. Here it is. What are calendar days? Every month contains 30 to 31 calendar days. So a calendar day is a day on the calendar. It is not a business day, Monday through Friday. So we have time. Excuse me, Shavina. I'm going to provide you with the MGL citation. One moment. Andy, I'll be, back. I'll be with you in a moment. The MGL is MGL 54, section 24. And what does it say? It says the, the aldermen and cities, except where city charters provide otherwise, and the selectmen of towns divided into voting precincts shall 20 days at least before the biennial state or annual or biennial city election and 10 days at least before any special election of a state or city officer therein designate the polling place for each voting precinct and cause it to be suitably fitted up and prepared therefore. It says that's 20 days. It doesn't define day. We have fine days. It's in, I look it up on the internet and you'll see. Dorothy, watch it. Just tone it down. I need you. Point of order, actually use the raise hand feature and not just shout out. Thank you. Thank you. Andy, you have your hand up. Yes. Um, I wish that we had time to research this. I don't know if Mandy knows the answer to this either, but it seems to me that when I have dealt with uh, statutory deadlines in Massachusetts, that the number, that how you count days depends upon the number of days before a deadline, and that um, for a shorter period of time, you do, um, you do not count weekend days, and for a longer period of time, weekend days are included, but we'd have to find that statutory rule. It's not just something we can make up. There is, I think, a statutory rule about how, how you count deadlines. Mandy Joe, I can see her looking carefully at something. Sarah, go ahead. So I just want to say with all due respect, because everybody's been working so hard and I have not been here for 30 days. So to all of you who have been working so very hard, I just have to respectfully say though, I, it, it upsets me when this is such a big deal that we would actually come to vote on this without actually having an option. Because if the, if we had to, if we basically just had to vote yes tonight because we had no other option, that's not a vote and that's upsetting. So, but I say that with all due respect because things have been really hard and I get it. Shalini, your hands up. Oh, I didn't realize my hand was up, but now that it is up, I, I agree with Sarah that is there a way for us to meet as many counselors that can meet tomorrow and do this? Because it feels like we're doing this under like time pressure and it's not the right thing. We're clearly hearing it from our community. 
and this is like really diverse groups of people coming to us and it just does not feel right so yeah. if there is a way we can find an exception like the calendar just the definition of calendar could that be used That's to say that we are defining calendar to include saturday and sunday and get away with it we're looking for the legal definition okay thank um, you so let's just wait off wait on that one evan ross you have your hand up this was actually in response to something earlier but i think it this obviously is getting very very difficult for all of us um I, I understand sarah's frustration i think part of it is that when this was presented to us on the 30th this council unanimously said yeah sure this sounds like a good idea let's go with that so the reason we weren't presented with many options is because we informed the 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 town clerk to move ahead with this and to prepare a report and so i'm, I'm not going to fault her for not giving us options tonight because we all said yeah let's go for it um, one thing I did want to just push back on actually was, was Pat's point um, of, of giving Shavina some time to investigate some of the other options we put out there. Uh, you know, Shavina, she put a lot of work into this proposal. It was well considered. It was well researched. She talked to the right people. A and if we're not going to move forward with it, I think it's on us to come up with the solution because I don't want to send back to her and say, we don't like that. Bring us another one. And who knows if we'll shoot it down or not. And so if we aren't moving forward with that, regardless of what these deadlines mean, regardless of the report is, I don't want to leave here tonight if we're not moving forward with the consolidated plan without giving the town clerk guidance about where we want the polling places to be. And she can come back and say, that's not going to work. But I don't want to say to her, hey, we know you did all that hard work. We didn't like it. So do another thing that maybe we'll reject. I'm not willing to do that because she has put in a lot of hard work. And when she last talked to us, we said, this looks great. And now we're coming back to her and saying, eh, try again. And I'm not willing to do that uh, and waste her time again. Thanks, Evan. Uh, Kathy. Unmute, un Kathy. Just so I understand, if we vote down the consolidation tonight, and we don't think we can meet again to talk about an alternative. For the primary, everything would stay the same. Nothing would change because we wouldn't have put out any notice. We that, could, I right? Know we can do that, but go ahead. Okay, so, but that's, if, if we can't, you know, if we don't have an, if Mandy's point is we can't come up with an alternative right now, I rewrote my thing to have four precincts moved to the high school. But if we can't do that tonight, because we have to have a memo that explains it, and we can't have a memo tonight, so we can't do that tonight. We're all willing to do it tonight. Um, this is, re we're in a box. If we do nothing, nothing changes. We could change it for November 3rd. I mean, we have more than 20 days before November 3rd. So I just wanna, we're not in a, we can't make a change, but, um, and, and yes, we heard on July 20th, a proposal to consolidate everything. I don't know why we didn't hear it earlier because I do feel that this time pressure um, and trying to think it through is what hit everyone. And if you remember, July 20th was the budget. And if you don't think we were on under, t we were hearing a lot about the budget and it's still reverberating. So. I think some of us, and I will say I'm one of them, I was asleep at the wheel. I did not think, oh my gosh, what are we doing? All I raised was transportation issues. Um, but but the the number of people, um, Sarah can talk about what happens in precinct one, we walk. People walk from all, all you know, and the student housing up here. I know you don't, Alyssa, because you're, I'm just saying there's a huge number of people in some of these precincts that walk. Not that everybody can walk. I don't, do I think the lines make sense? Absolutely not. But that's going to be a larger discussion why one side of the street goes one place and the other side of the street goes another. This is, re, you know, it's kind of like, why? Well, that's the way it is um, for, for precinct one and three, particularly. Um, but even when you, but I just think if we do nothing tonight, if the thing fails, then we are every current polling site 
is in place. And then we have a problem with bangs is the only one I've heard. We literally have a problem with bangs because of space constraints inside. And Andy had asked me uh, whether it, bangs could hold two precincts, but not three. You know, whether there are two floors where we could have one entering and one different. Um, so if we physically can't do three there, then we've got a problem with bangs. Um, but, but we're in, if 20 days is not 20 calendar days, um, and Mandy says we can't have this report with a different thing. I, I mean, I could write, rewrite the whole report, but it's, it's going to be a lot of rewriting because it was rewritten around why going to one place made sense. It, it needs a major rewrite. But we're talking about, I counted it up. It's two, two, two current users of Bangs move the fire station, and then Crocker's an open question of could it be closed for a couple more days for a deep clean, and we use still use Crocker for Crocker. That seems to be a possibility with three days of, of less of people in that building. So it's not an impossible thing to do for both September and November. So I just want to lay, it's not that we have no options. If we do nothing tonight, everything stays the same. And then we have to come back and say, do we want to change November? I'm done. You had a comment. Was that me? Did you say me? Paul, oh, actually, I'm oh. trying to check with our town attorney. Um, Mandy Joe, do you have any further clarification? I can't give legal advice. I think it's the town attorney that needs to do it. Um, a cursory search has not found a definition of computation of time in the MGLs. Steve. So I just. <laughs> There is a motion and a second on the floor to, to vote to reconsider on the basis that we don't know what the definition of days is and the best information we have is that tomorrow's our deadline. So I think that's a pretty important. So if that turns out not to be the case and we find that out, then we can hold another meeting a week from today and reconsider that vote. But I'm much more comfortable moving through this reconsideration vote to see if we have a majority that want to do that and then re-voting on, well, basically re-voting on the issue. Um, Um, okay, so there is a motion on the floor. It's been made and seconded. It's to reconsider. Shalini? I just want to be clear that just because we are now reached a different position of voting does not mean we don't respect the work that the town clerk did in this report. I think one of our jobs as district counselors is to reach out to our districts and we did that and we heard from our residents and we heard overwhelmingly from diverse groups of people and that's what's changing our opinion. It has nothing to do with the town clerk's um, effort and I do realize that she's put in a lot of effort and we appreciate that completely. But um, I think, um, that, yeah, no, that's all. Thank you. Um, George Ryan. One more time. The town clerk has told us we have 20 days. She's the town clerk. Banks, we have to move. The North Fire Station is out. Shut down. Can't be used. It's two, at least. The school superintendent has begged us, basically, not to use Crocker. But right. we, some of us at least, are open to shutting the school down for a couple days, just so we can use it again for what it was never built for in the first place. Leaving aside for a moment the other two schools, 
then many people have expressed concerns for a long time about being used as polling places. And now in the age of COVID-19, we're going to send countless numbers in there, even though we know many don't want it. So yes, there are a lot of voices to listen to. Some have been here tonight, but there are lots of other voices we've heard from from a long time. And there are also voices of expertise, like the school superintendent, the town clerk. They seem to have some weight too. This is not an easy decision. It's not the best decision by any means, but it seems to me it's the only one we really have. Paul, you have your hand up. I'm hoping you might have information. I, I don't have information. I, I hesitate to wade, wade in on this um, because it's gonna be my opinion where, so it's not a legal opinion. So if, and I don't know if that's appropriate or not. Um, go ahead. So I, th I think that if you, if you, the question is, could we take a vote? Could the council take a vote tonight? Um, and the reason the sense you might not be able to take a vote on say the modified proposal was that there isn't a report three days prior to that. Now you could say that the report that was prepared it was larger and you're modifying it down so you you have done the you know the broader broadest way you would have the most radical thing you could have done and you're going to broaden it you're going to narrow it down so you could could argue that this that modified vote could suffice um we don't know that uh town attorney probably asleep uh not answering texts but um the if you vote that, then you could, if that's, if we find out tomorrow that that's through the Secretary of State's office, that's not legal, then we'd have to come back and visit it again. But, but recognizing there is a motion for reconsideration on the floor. I, I guess, Paul, I'm trying to figure out what you were suggesting, that we could vote a modified something So the the re, if the sense of urgency is that the 20 days expires tomorrow mm -hmm. and that you can't vote tonight because there hasn't been a report done three days prior, mm -hmm. um, if either of those things is not accurate, then you have time, but we don't know. So what is the best scenario forward? I would actually, so I say, take an action tonight um, on the modified thing or reconsider. There's a motion on the floor to reconsider. Yep. And uh, if there are any other comments, Dorothy. You need to unmute Dorothy. You're still not unmuted, Dorothy. Okay. I just have been having a very Orwellian feeling that words are being defined in ways that I don't know. We have a vote. And then because some people don't like the vote, then we have a motion to reconsider. Um, I, I'm feeling pretty unhappy about that. I think we heard a lot of things we heard from many, a big cross section. We have an idea of how we can do things. I don't want to be part of creating a COVID catastrophe. And this election's big and it's huge. There's going to be so many people. I really don't want to be part of having made that or helped that happen. So I hope that I would agree that we can do as Paul suggests and say that we had a larger, very dramatic proposal. We have then been reducing that. It's a modified proposal and that we could go ahead and vote to stick with the vote that we had tonight. That gives time for the town clerk and the schools and whatever to come up with um, a new plan. And that could include, as I said before, checking some private places as well. I just don't, I think we've got the talent, we've got the energy to do it. And I think that they can come up with a great plan that would reflect what we have been saying here tonight. And I hope we do. Alyssa. 
So just a couple quick things. Yes, it's absolutely ridiculous that we don't know how computation of time works for that particular MGL. That, that's just bad, yep, that we don't know if it's calendar days or business days. That's just a fact, but we don't know it and it's too late to call anybody to ask them. Um, Mandy Jo knows how it works in our charter and we know how it works in our bylaws because we've specified that. But different MGLs actually have different ways of computing time, so there is no standard. So it doesn't matter what you Google, Dorothy. What matters is what the state says the interpretation is. And it could even be that different levels of the Secretary of State's office won't even agree on what it is. So now we're stuck. We're in this box, right, that we don't know what we can do. I disagree with Paul. I'm sure that will shock him in that the report actually isn't, can't just be modified. The report's not something that we can just modify into something else, not that I agree with, because one of the reasons I'm saying it's not a disparate impact is because we were moving everyone. When we're only moving some of the people, which in fact we are going to do, there is no such thing as a default to the way it is now. We are going to move some of the people, and I can't, I don't see a case, I have not had seen a case made that that will not have a disparate impact on certain parts of town to move some people and not other people. We might be moving some of the most vulnerable populations to a different location, but leaving all the people who are used to being able to drive their car or walk, leaving them alone. So that to me is the very definition of a disparate impact. So I can't say that the report could be used that way. And let's remember, as we keep saying, we can't default to normal unless you're going to say, Sorry, Chief Nelson, we're opening the fire station. So if, if, if the calendar computation is, I mean, whatever you want to call it, the computation of days that Shaveen is working under is today, then that means the default is our current locations. Therefore, we are going to open every single thing we have. You, we can't change that if that's true. And so if we don't control use of the schools, it doesn't matter really what Mike thinks now versus what Mike thinks two weeks from now. He can decide at any moment that we can't use the schools. Paul can't make him let us use the schools. So we are in a really difficult place here and just exploring more doesn't answer what's gonna be available to us on September and November. Shavina did the best she could to define the places she thought would be used in September and November. We can't control, we can't say, oh, the school committee can just close down the school for three days to clean. It's not our choice. We don't get that option but we've put ourselves in that box if we let it default. I yes. agree that if we can find out tomorrow we can change it, then we should. Kathy. Okay, in the long report that we were given, there is a paragraph on an act relative to voting options in response to COVID-19, section 11. The first sentence says, notwithstanding section 24 of chapter 54 of the general laws or any other general law to the contractor. Then it goes on to say at least 20 days prior to the date of the primary election. Um, it's a very, it's a notwithstanding. And as I'm reading the early voting, it's seven days before the election and the seven is a computation based on September 1st. It's not 10 days before it's seven days you know it's it's the way we would define it rather than business days so i think 20 days is in fact calendar days now i know that doesn't leave us with this but i i don't think you can read this any other way because it's not withstanding and we can't get an attorney thing but We've never had a section 11, an act rel relative to the voting options in response to COVID-19 before. This is brand new, enacted. And this has the same pieces that the three days prior to changing the polling place, you have to make publicly available on the website at the Office of the Love, uh, report on its evaluation. Um, and so I also think the report that I read I can't accept that report in several sections and several sentences. So, you know, whether or not I believed in consolidation, I, so I think the report has to be rewritten anyway to argue, but I just think 20 days is in fact 20 calendar days reading this notwithstanding section 11. Um, and we're in the new horrendous world created 
for us by COVID, <laughs> which, um, and so well, that's, that's all I can say is, I mean, I think we do have time if we want to take it. Shalini. Yeah, and we just received an email that sent that we have several cases, so I just like to cite one of them, which is Hare versus Bell 21, Massachusetts 3541826, which says after a time period is longer than one week, Sundays are counted unless they are expressly excluded. Could we just use that as the basis for our decision tonight? Thank you to the person who sent us this email. The problem we have with um, using that is it's not our town attorney and I, I received the same email and appreciate the information provided. Um, they, it, it would be better if we had our own town attorney given interpretation or frankly, we had somebody who could look at this law and tell us what it is. The way it was meant, Dorothy Pam. There's a new emergency amendment 22 as changed to H4768. Oh, Bob, it just went off. Okay. Um, it's about um, COVID. It said, notwithstanding section 24 of chapter 54 of the general laws or any other general specific law to the contrary, select board, board of selectmen, town council, city council may vote to change any polling place to be used at the primary election or general election at least 15 days prior to the date of the primary election or general election if it is determined that the public convenience or public health would be better served. If the select board, board of selectmen, town council, or city council determines that the public convenience or public health would be better served, they may house all polling place in a single place in the municipality if such a building is suitable. So it says you can do this, you can do that. You can make your changes according to public health 15 days. So we're getting all kinds of things. All right, there, there's a motion on the floor to reconsider. It's been made and seconded. I'm gonna call the question. Um, we start with Pam. No. Ross. Yes. Ryan. Yes. Shane. No. Fiber. Yes. Steinberg. Yes. Schwartz. No. Paul Milne. No. Brewer. Yes. DeAngelis. No. Uh, Dumont. No. Reesburn. I'm going with a yes. Haneke. Mm. Yes. It's seven, four, and, and six against. Mm. Worst vote I think any of us have ever had to take because there is no good solution. Absolutely none. And if we waited for another 40 minutes, we'd be in tomorrow. So um, we still have several items on our agenda. I'd like to check to see whether or not some of them can be delayed. I think we need to vote. I have a point of order. Um, and actually, I think Athena has made that point of, we voted to reconsider, but we haven't re-voted. Right, right, okay. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. So now we are voting to reconsider and um, consideration. Um, we're back to the original motion, and that's to locate in person voting on September 1st, 2020, November 30th, 2020, for all 10 voting precincts at Amherst Pelham Regional High School, 21 Mattoon Street, as this will have no disparate adverse impact on access to the polls on the basis of race, national origin, disability, income, or age. 
and we'll start with Ross. Yes. Ryan. Yes. Shane. No. Schreiber. Yes. Steinberg. Yes. Schwartz. No. Paul Milne. No. Brewer. Yes. DeAngelis. No. Dumont. No. Reesmer is yes. Haneke. Yes. So it's seven to five, a six. Dorothy needs to vote. No. I'm sorry, Dorothy. Did I miss you? Yes. Okay. It's seven to six. Pat. Yes, I'm going to make a suggestion not about um, this vote. Uh, we have a very intense agenda. I would like to um, move that we have an additional council meeting on the 10th so that we can complete this agenda, but that we should stop at the end of this um, now, in, you know, or the next few minutes. Um, second. Is there, a, is there a second? I second that. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Point of order? Yes. I, I guess I'm clarifying the motion. Stopping now or stopping after we vote on the election warrant? I, I'm sorry. I thought we had voted on that. I'm very tired. Um, after we complete the vote on the election, I would like us to adjourn the meeting and agree to meet on the 10th to complete the agenda. Particularly because there, you know, the policing issue, there are so many things that uh, master plan update, things that really need to be looked at. And if we don't add to that agenda, it can be a shorter meeting. Does that help, Mandy? Yes. So we have one more vote. Yes, uh, we will vote on the vote on the motion that has just been made, and that is to carry the rest of this meeting over into uh, August 10th at 6.30. And so the motion's been made, it's been seconded. I'll start with Pam. Hold on, if we do that now, we can't vote on the warrant. Ah, thank you. All right, then I take that back. Or we, how, do we put that on hold? Yeah, we can table it till after voting on the warrant. Yes, that's what I thought we decided. No. The next vote motion then is to authorize the warrant for the state primary election on Tuesday, September 1st, 2020. The polls open from 7 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. at the following location, all voting precincts, Amherst, Pelham Regional High School, 21 Mattoon Street. Second. Manny, Joe, you have your hand up. Yeah, uh, if there wasn't a second, I'll second it. Um, I, I had a comment on the warrant that it, it needs, I think, two modifications. It needs to say Amherst-Pelham Regional High School. Um, and the third line down on what elect offices, counselor, has eight district. I think that's supposed to be eighth district. Okay. Make sure those changes are made before it's signed. Uh, this is a roll call vote. We're going to start with um, Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. No. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. No. Melanie Balmilne? No. Alyssa Brewer? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Yes. 
No. Reese Murphy, yes. Haneke? Yes. And Pam? No. So the vote is eight, four, five against, no abstentions, and nobody absent. We're going to now move, go back to the vote we tabled, and that is to um, meet on August 10th, 2020 at 6.30 to continue the agenda that we did not complete tonight. The motion's been made and seconded. I'll do a roll call vote. And that starts with George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Yes. Shalini Balmil. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Yes. Pat Angelus. Yes. Darcy Dumont. Darcy? I said yes. Oh, thank you. Lynn Griesmer is a yes. Mandy Jo Haneke? Yes. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Evan Ross? Yes. Given that, the meeting is adjourned and we will see you again on the 6th, I mean, on the 10th at 6.30. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.